Okay, welcome. This is uh, Duvid. I have here with me today Veronica Kuzniar and her partner Vincent, and we'll be talking about uh, different aspects of World War II history today, nationalism. Uh, Veronica is a renowned author. She's been on JF show. She's written tens of tens of books on various subjects, including organizational psychology and has a master's degree in military history and knows quite a bit about World War II. And uh, I heard her talking on JF and had a lot of interesting questions to ask her. And uh, you know, thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. And you know, unfortunately, I just started the stream, so there's almost nobody watching. But uh, you know, will be documented on the YouTube. And uh, so, if you just want to give a, a brief bio overview of what you do, and then maybe we could go into talking about World War II. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll go ahead and start. Um, I started getting into studying World War II. The very first book I read on the topic was William Shirear's Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, and that would have been around 2000 to 2002. Just started reading about it strictly out of curiosity. Um, I wanted to know why this German empire became so massive, and then basically Hitler the madman just threw it all away and had this genocide and, you know, nothing ever really made sense as far as how it was taught to me in middle school. So I guess it was just sheer curiosity. I've always had kind of a military interest. Don't ask me why, but going back to grade school, I used to write little short essays on warfare. So um, I've always been kind of a tomboyish type. So then I started seriously researching World War II Hitler in 2003 to 2005 for my liberal arts major. So I had to write an essay on, well, my proposed topic was Hitler's persecution of the Jews in World War II. What was the basis of it? And I found that um, a lot of his ideology regarding Jews generally came from his Catholic Christian upbringing. But then he was influenced later by the ideology of basically just the people that were surrounding the early DAP, which eventually became the NSDAP. Um, from there, I decided, because I got so into it and I came across revisionism, I came across the IHR during that research, and I'd never, ever heard of people that were, quote unquote, denying the Holocaust, and I couldn't believe it. And then David Irving, of course, I went and listened to him one time. I met with him a couple other times after that, and I just really got into the divergent view of World War II. So I couldn't believe that there was this whole other side of the story to be explored. So that's how I got into that. And I decided to get my master's in military history in order to write books as a credible historian on this topic. So that's where I am today. Um, let's see, I've written, it's, I think I'm over 30 books now. I did do a year of a PsyD PhD program. So it was doctor of psychology with an emphasis in conflict mediation resolution. And so I have a series of six books on all the topics and research I did during that coursework. And then I have all of my military history questions, like the weekly questions and my essays that I produced in six volumes there, my military history desk general series. And then I have a slew of World War II books ranging from the view of world Freemasonry from the German perspective, particularly the Nazi perspective, all the way to how they viewed high finance and its role in war, um, and then just strictly military. My specialty, I think, is minorities in the German army and Reich. So just ethnic, political, et cetera, minorities. Yeah, very interesting. And hopefully we'll talk about the minorities. And I've looked into that. And uh, people who know me, you know, see my YouTube page. I'm, I'm affiliated with the Hare Krishna movement. And I've researched mm -hmm. a lot of Hinduism. And have looked into the you know the alliance between India and not in uh, Germany. If uh, if you know much about that topic, maybe we talk about that also. It's very interesting. And 
Yeah, yeah I mean, Himmler was really big into Hinduism. He's the one that wanted to research the connection there back to the early Indo-Germanic peoples. Yeah, and some people might actually claim that uh, Himmler and Hindu and, and Hitler were actually Hindus, and that that would be the most accurate way to describe them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've heard oh, that Hitler. Yeah, I've heard that Hitler was an avatar. Yes, as prophesied by what uh, Savitri Devi was Savitri talking about. Devi. That like he was the um, some kind of incarnation of a Hindu god of um, rebirth and destruction. Both, I think yeah. it was v Vishnu verse. Yeah, the Bhagavad Gita yeah. has a verse about um, an Vishnu. avatar of Krishna coming every generation to restore truth, and the the claim oh, okay. that the claim that Himmler. Um, carried a Bhagavad Gita with him, had in his entourage a Sanskrit scholar, so that when he traveled, he had a Sanskrit scholar and, and read from the Bhagavad Gita every night. And, uh, you know, I, I know you wrote the book about the cult of Hitler worship and uh, different mm -hmm. understandings of that, and, and uh, if that fits more into a Hindu ideology. And obviously, German was the first nation to start translating, and most of the Indologists uh, originally were German and the translation of the Vedic scriptures and the German people had the most respect for Indian culture and uh, possibly the most similarities. But it's an interesting topic of research that a lot of people don't know too much about. And the, the World War II is such a huge topic that it's hard to understand all the implications. And obviously it was World War II that affected every part of the planet in some way. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, the Jewish center to, today, you know, like certainly as a Jew, uh, the creation of Israel, Zionism, the Holocaust, uh, you, to, to some extent, I, I was saying that the Holocaust is probably the most significant event in all of Jewish history, even if you accept the biblical account is true. And uh, proportion wise, even, you know, leaving Egypt, slavery in Egypt, uh, the splitting of the Red Sea, coming to Israel, all the battles of the prophets, uh, that the Holocaust conceivably is still the most significant event in all of Jewish history till today. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, trying to understand uh, how something like that could happen, European history. And, and you know, I've, I've been saying this stuff for 25 years, hundreds of books and the rise of Jews, how Jews became so big in Europe and where do the population centers come from? And I, I'd done research on it because it, it would appear to be that there had been about 5 million Jews in the world when uh, the Romans conquered Jerusalem 2,000 years ago and destroyed the temple. And I, I don't know if your military history expertise is, is throughout world history. And if you. Yeah, we did the, cover that. Yep. Um, you know, so that, that dwindles to possibly about 300,000 Jews after the complete destruction, the Bar Kokhba revolts, and the later revolts, that uh, it could be there was down to about 300,000 Jews in the world. And it raises to about a million till about the 1750s there was only a million jews in the world and there's something special about polish history where the population explosion of jews was largely in poland starting in about 1750 to 1900 that uh, somehow poland there arises to be like 10 million jews and a lot of the jews that even make up english german jews were people that came over from this population explosion and Poland and Poland has an extremely complicated history, you know, to mm -hmm. where the Polish Lithuanian Empire was one of the largest empire, and they had actually invited the Jews in when the Jews were facing expulsions in France and Germany. That Poland, uh, you know, made a strategic move to be friendly to the Jews and allow us uh, certain privileges. That, that uh, you know, there are these huge Jewish settlements that by World War II, you possibly had Jewish towns that had as many as like a hundred thousand ultra Orthodox Jews. And I don't know if you have any expertise in the Polish history to fill in gaps, like how that was possible, what were the Poles thinking, um, and how was it that Jewish population was able to have such a boom to, you know, that there a tenfold increase in the rural Jewish population within 150 years in Europe? I'm not really too familiar with Polish history or Jewish history in Poland, but I do find it interesting that Poland has always risen and been essentially okay after all these massive conflagrations. And whereas Russia and Germany have suffered immensely, and those two countries were particularly persecutory of Jews. We see, at least in the Third Reich era, and then with the Russians, 
there was some of that before World War II. And then, of course, after World War II, when Stalin essentially turns on the Jews and wants to banish them to Birbijan. So it seems like Poland always ends up on the side of the victors, even though there was suffering, of course, during World War II because it got swallowed by two empires. There might be something to that, like um, perhaps Jewish high finance, Jewish organizations, etc., sort of try to protect Poland from too much persecution by imperial agendas, etc. cetera. Uh, I have not looked into that at all, but it wouldn't surprise me if that was the case. Because we see, again, Poland today is not really being too harshly persecuted for not accepting any of these refugees. They seem to be the only country that's allowed to get away with that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my expertise on Europe is very small, and most of it's related to to Jewish history. Although I may just briefly mention that you know the history of the emancipation of the Jews that it comes with the French Enlightenment. Historically, Jews always had a different marker on their citizenship. Although possibly there are many Jews who converted to Catholicism or intermarried, gained full citizenship, but mm -hmm. largely the Jews were a separate entity within Europe and lived under the crown with special protections, you know, like you know noble land rights and they had special sections and, and Jews had certain restrictions and certain privileges like hard to own property, uh, but the Jews served many financial functions in terms of actually money lenders or right. tax farmers um, where, where Jews would be tax farmers for the crown. And you, you, God forbid that could you know, cause us to not be such a light group that we, that we were, um, you know, some money lenders and middlemen, businessmen so much, but tax farmers certainly is not a, a well-like profession and uh however you know when napoleon the french revolution jews are fully emancipated and considered you know that's part of jews had been a, enough of a powerful force in europe that uh, the french advertised to the jews in order to take the side of the french that we would be given full rights and full citizenship and then slowly that comes to germany and england and uh this bulk of polish jews that have uh, been able to build up, you know, there'd only been hundreds of thousands of the Jews all across Europe, and then you have these millions of Jews from Eastern Europe that's, that, that uh, after the French Re Revolution, start moving you uh, to Western Northern Europe in, in uh, larger numbers. But even in Germany, the, I saw the statistics that uh, um, there's only 600,000 Jews in, uh, in Germany in like the 30s, and by mm -hmm. the time 1939, there's down, there's only 300,000 Jews. And, and then according to uh, um, Bryant uh, Riggs, Mark Riggs, who I just ordered his books from uh, your suggestion, you, he, he estimated that before 1870, intermarriage between uh, Jews and non-Jews was extremely small. And then 1870, they changed the Germanic laws and emancipation of the Jews. And you have a certain element of intermarriage, and that's why he estimates that there were about 60,000 half-Jews uh, you know, by the 30s and about 190,000 quarter Jews or something like that. And right. a lot of those actually served in the army. And you know, we've talked about nationalism and, and maybe even colorism, that there was a you know, from Holocaust stories, there's a woman here in Detroit who's semi-prominent and she wrote a book and she mentioned her mother and her sister and her mother who had red hair and blue eyes was saved and her aunt who had uh, darker features was left to die in the, that, uh, that had had a big play, you know, from what Bryant was saying that, uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, Jews who had light features and specifically Aryan blood and I'm not, have you read uh, Hilberg's uh, Destruction of Eastern European Jews? I've only read portions of that insofar as it was quoted by revisionists, etc. I've not actually read his book straight through. I've just seen like basically people deconstructing that or attempting to. Is your research largely based on secondhand sources or have you actually looked into archives and government documents and uh, like letters and no i i mainly try to look at primary evidence if i am looking in a secondary source i'm trying to find what the actual primary sources are saying before these historians enter in with their own analyses of that information so there's quite a few historians now that really quote extensively from the primary sources 
um, that Hitler's speech I acquired was directly from the IFZ. So that's direct German archives. Um, I've also gotten quite a bit as far as the Gleivitz incident and whatnot from diaries, letters, and the National Archives of the United mm -hmm. States. So. So I mean, the main thing I, I was hoping that you would be able to, you know, fill in some of your research, and uh, you know, maybe we could complement each other with our different areas of research. Is, you know, Kristallnacht and the transfer agreement, and and possibly Zionism. That you know, Zionism. We, we were discussing you know, before we went live that, to, to a large extent, among within the Jewish community, Zionism is considered a heresy. Until today, um, you know, within ultra orthodox Jews in Israel, Zionism is like the worst of all heresies. It goes against the traditional belief, but Zionism fits in the larger European nationalistic school of the right. late 1800s and you know the common expressions poland for the poles germany for the german russian for the russians and israel for the jews and uh there's a certain element you know say as a religious jew saying do we want a jew a jewish ethno state in someone who's trying to live according to biblical prophecies and say you know where does it talk about a nation in in sense there's nothing about a jewish nation and you know, certain things about returning to Israel, but within Eastern European at the time, this rise of nationalism for the Jews and uh, it is uh, arising from the same school of all the nationalisms across Europe. Right. Um, there were, in fact, several competing factions of Jews and different Zionist groups in Germany prior to that Havara agreement. And of course, the ones that dovetailed most closely with what Hitler wanted was removal of Jews from Germany. Those were the ones that won out and they tended to be the most extreme. So that would have been like kind of the uh, Yabotinsky click as it were. So yeah, I mean, their goals coincided. And of course we know that the Irgun wanted to actually collaborate militarily and perform acts of terror in behalf of the Axis against the British Mandate government in Palestine in order to get that state for the Jews. So anti-Semitism oddly becomes the best friend of fervent Zionists. And of course, they had reached out to Mussolini as well. So yeah, I would say that um, ultimately most forms of nationalism have like an extremist core. I don't think it can exist without that extremist core because most people, they're not really fanatics in that respect. They might say, yeah, I'm white. I like my white culture and white identity or whatever, or yeah, I'm Jewish. I like my Jewish identity. I don't want to be persecuted for it, but they're not so extreme as to engage in like acts of terror or engage in revolutionary warfare to acquire a state or a community for themselves. So as regards nationalism, yes, um, it's always, it always has its extremist elements. So let's make sure, let's talk, I guess, first about the transfer agreement and then, okay. you know, chronologically and then Crystal Knock. Um, you know, according to Hilberg, it's, the sources are, are difficult, to, but you, you have the boycott of Nazi Germany that's largely Correct. organized by the World Jewish Congress and uh, it picks up quite a bit of steam and even a lot of uh, official nations, maybe Poland, parts of mm -hmm. Poland, even full nations, uh, sign on to this boycott. And uh, it's largely being effective. It's crippling Germany to some extent beyond all the other things that have been crippling it. And, and uh, I don't know to say if the Zionists were the first group to break the boycott or one of the groups that decided it was in their advantage to go against the boycott and team up with the Nazis. Well well, let me ask, I mean, maybe Veronica knows better than me on this, but I mean, am I incorrect in thinking that the uh, the boycott really didn't have all that much negative effect on Germany's economy? They were flourishing, you know, despite the this uh, economic boycott, were they not? No, I mean, my understanding is Germany was suffering pretty bad in the, I mean, already even without the boycott, and the boycott was really hampering them down and they needed money extremely badly in the in the, the Zionist Havor agreement was at least able to provide a, a flow of income into into Germany and to into start to break the boycott. But you maybe Veronica knows yeah. this the, the Havara? No. There's actually two different versions of that. Um 
what Ingrid Veckert found is that Germany wasn't really being that negatively affected by the boycott. And she right. says that the fact that Germany's economy was still recovering despite this worldwide Jewish boycott is just testament to the genius of its leadership. And the fact that they were able to <laughs> circumvent that by and large, it did hurt the Germans ultimately because export or die as we've heard. But Hitler and Hjalmar Schacht were working on uh, monetary policy and trade policy that would ultimately circumvent that world export need. They were trying to focus inward on Europe, trade within Europe, especially Eastern Europe and Turkey. And that is, in fact, why Britain got so roused by what Hitler was doing. It's referred to by H.W. Koch, a very prominent World War II historian, as the Reichsmark block. And what Hitler was ultimately doing was creating this kind of unofficial block for Reichsmark trade and German trade in particular to circumvent the Sterling block, which had been set up by the British. Once that started happening and really taking off, Churchill was hell-bent on war with Hitler. That was really what did it. Um, Britain just couldn't have that harm to its trade and its position as you know, world financier kind of number one. It's just like the United States of America. Our dollar is very powerful worldwide. If China or Russia were to come up with an alternate, like, quote unquote, world currency, we would be having some serious issues. So that's essentially what was happening to Britain. They were in the position of America today with the sterling. So yeah, that I would say, even said, is the real reason. Churchill even said so much. I mean, by the mid 1930s, he was quoted saying such things as, "We will force this war on Hitler if he wants it or not." Uh, mm -hmm. 1936, if Germany becomes too powerful, we have to crush it. Uh, 1939, this war is an English war, and its goal is the destruction of Germany. Um, and then in 1946, yep. Churchill told Truman, "I don't know if this was in a letter." Uh, must have been in the letter. This war was more about conquering sales markets. We could have prevented this war from breaking out without firing a shot, but we didn't want to. Right. So it's mixed on that. There was some damage inflicted, yes, but because Hitler was focused on turning inward into Europe and kind of dominating the continent economically and really forming a niche for Germany on the continent, it wasn't as effective as the international Jews would have liked. Now, the Zionists saw this, however, as the perfect opportunity, seeing as how the Balfour Declaration was not quite working out how they wanted, and they weren't getting the complicity they needed through the British to get that state for the Jews in Palestine. And so they turned to Hitler, and they said, look, we have some agreement here. World Jewry just literally declared war on Hitler, and we can circumvent and um, basically go against that boycott. And that will help us in turn by getting him on board with our Zionist project, because he'll not only break the boycott by doing trade with us as we go into Palestine, which is exactly what happened. The German economy was literally the foundation of fledgling Israel without it, and it really can't be overstated, Israel might have withered and died right then and there and never been born into the Jewish state. So it was fundamental, it was foundational that that German foreign currency was going to Palestine and that those um, migrants were going to Palestine to populate it because the Arabs were so much more populous there. According, so to, Hilberg, it, according to Hilberg, that... Uh, you know, one thing, like you were mentioning, like the the Catholic background, Hilberg compares the Spanish uh, expulsion of Jews of 1492 uh -huh. to uh, to to eventually the Holocaust, and said it follows the same exact pattern. And also, if you consider the you know, money lending e expulsion, that Jews are encouraged to leave, and mm -hmm. they're only allowed to take a certain proportion of their wealth with them. So somehow the Zionists were able to work out an agreement, because I mean, as we said, there were about 600,000 Jews in Germany um, when the Nazis came to power and about half of them get out of Germany by the, uh, you know, by uh, 
the late 30s, very mm-hmm. few of them want to have any interest in going to Israel. Maybe less five, ten percent of them went to Israel. Most of them tried to come to the U.S. or other parts of Europe. Uh, but somehow that that money that was confiscated from Jews. I mean, late, so originally when the Jews who voluntarily left Germany and they had a certain amount of money that they were allowed to take, and of the rest of that money um, went back to the state, and a certain percentage of that went to Israel. Is that correct? Well, as far as the immigration plan through Havara, that literally took all of their money and transferred it to Palestine. So as far as I know, the state didn't take any of that. Those were special accounts that were deposited with the Wasserman Bank, and I think the other one was the Warburg Bank. So that was a special case. So they were not subjected to the same Reich flight tax as, say, German immigrants would have been who were leaving Germany. So it was, in fact, ethnic Germans who were punished financially and had much of their money confiscated, yeah, if they left, not the Jews under Havara. Now, if the Jews had left before that agreement of 33, I'm not totally sure if that applied to them or not. That I haven't looked into. So they may have been like, for example, I know that, um, was it Albert Einstein who left Germany before Hitler actually came into power or right around that time? Um, he might have I don't. Switzerland, but I mean, he eventually comes to America, but yeah, I think he comes, he goes from Germany to Switzerland. Right. So I don't, I don't know if people like him before this actually took effect were punished financially in that respect with that so called Reich flight tax. But that's one of the things that um, revisionist historian Ingrid Veckert debunks. She said that is not the case with all the Jewish immigrants who went to Palestine. And in fact, there were Jewish organizations in through the Zionist agencies, of course, that were willing to finance even poor Jewish immigrants. So even if they didn't have the required 1,000 Palestine pounds, which was not a German stipulation, but a British stipulation to get into Palestine in the first place, um, they could be funded directly from supporters of the project. So wealthy American Jews or whoever was on board with this project, the Nazis were all about that. They said, whatever we have to do, even if it sort of hurts our economy a little bit and hurts our trade, we're going to do it to facilitate this. And that's what's so stunning about the transfer agreement. And Hitler, in fact, went against some of his advisors that were saying, you know, this is going to cause problems with the Arabs. It's already starting. They're seeing this influx. They're seeing these German goods coming in. They're seeing German currency coming in with these immigrants. And it's putting them at an advantage over the um, Jews that were already there, the entrepreneurial Jews that were already in Palestine, as well as the Arab merchants and whatnot that were there. So they were actually angry in trying to protest what the Zionists and Nazis were doing through Havara. It's a crazy convoluted thing, but they had opposition from many angles. So the fact that it worked out even as well as it did and that an estimated 70,000 Jews went to Palestine during this transfer agreement is remarkable in and of itself. And that's really owing to the will of Hitler to get fully behind this despite the penalties and negative consequences that it entailed. We have to look at the whole years. I mean, starting in, I think, 33 till the Evian Conference, there's a slow chipping away at the rights that Jews had had um, right. You know, eventually full confiscation of property. And, and from what I understand, and, and Hil- Hilberg writes about it and you know, even gives numbers that uh, a certain percentage of the property that was confiscated by from Jews was actually given to Israel. And I think Hilberg says it was 25 percent that, uh, you know, so when Germany starts um, mm-hmm. depossessing Jews of their citizenship and taking their businesses and property away from them, that uh, actually a portion of that money is going to Israel. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, That would be like the quote unquote Aryanization or Germanization of Jewish businesses, which started slowly being applied 
Uh, but there's an interesting book by Dan Silverman, I think, or Dan Silver called Hitler's Economy. And he talks about how that process was a lot slower going than we've been told, than suggested. He said there were still completely Jewish dominated and owned businesses, including like um, industrial conglomerates in 1938. So it didn't proceed as quickly as we might think it did. So that's kind of important to make sure we don't say that this was just, yeah, Germany just stomps all over their heads and grabs everything in 1933. It was a slow process and the Germans realized they couldn't just literally throw the Jews out of these positions because it was integral to the economy. They had to do this very slowly and they had to make sure that the Germans who were receiving these businesses knew what they were doing. They knew how to run it because the Jews were running very efficient businesses and the Germans realize this. It's in that book. It's, it's really quite good because it gets into the fine details of the economy and how it all worked. But yeah, I mean, the whole goal was to slowly apply more and more pressure, discriminatory pressure on the Jews and to also encourage a separate Jewish identity to kind of kindle that nationalist fervor within them that they are a separate people in order to get them on board with the Zionist project. So that's why the Nazis said, you know, if you're a Zionist Jew, you can fly your own flag, you can have marches, you can wear your uniforms. It's all separate from German nationalism, from, from quote unquote Nazism. And they really tried to encourage that. Well, just to try to fathom, you know, because obviously today probably majority of Jews would fall into a Zionist camp. Uh, mm -hmm. But at the time of World War, uh, you know, the 30s, Zionism was a small heretical movement that maybe only a few percentage of the Jews total, can, you know, supported or cared about. Uh, but this small factional movement is able to work out a deal with the Nazis and mm -hmm. so that if you're a Jew in Germany and God forbid they're having their property being confiscated or they're leaving the country and can't take uh, um, what they consider their wealth with them, that uh, you know, most Jews are unaware that uh, some of this money is being given to the Zionist movement in Israel. Because as I said, most Jews uh, till today, you know, and relatively till today, most Jews, their destination of choice isn't necessarily Israel and certainly World War uh, two very few Jews had interest in going to Israel. So when they right. see that they're um, and, and even most Holocaust survivors, like I hear their stories, and I've, I've even mentioned to them, um, don't know or would reject that uh, the, that a part of their confiscated money uh, did in fact uh, go to Israel. Right, and I mean it makes sense because they don't know what the future of that state is going to be. This is a fledgling project, and yes, you're right. It was in fact Adolf Hitler who saved Zionism from extinction. It was the anti-Semitic movements of Europe that really saved it and gave it its foundation and its support. And um, just going back to the beginning of Havara, it was in fact Palestinian representatives of the citrus growing company Hanatea Limited in February of 33, who approached the NSDAP and said, hey, we can realize emigration of Jews and, you know, you can get rid of your Jewish population and we can also have support for our Zionist project and, you know, getting our Jewish state underway if you get on board with this. So they were the ones who approached the German authorities and got this started. It was now, that company in particular. I'm going to be interested to hear your thoughts on Kristallnacht and, uh, you know, to say that Zionists would, have, God forbid, uh, had an interest in Kristallnacht because they were getting money from the dispossession of Jews in Germany. That they're saying if uh, the German government confiscated more property from the Jews, that the fact is that a certain percentage of that went to Israel and mm -hmm. so on. Came, um, but you know, maybe before we get into Kristallnacht, we could close through the end. Uh, does the is it till the Evian conference that uh, you know, when, when does the transfer agreement end? When's the last payment of uh, the Nazi government to Zionist uh, made? Or is it unclear whether it, it possibly even went through uh, into the mid 40s, these pay the uh, financial you, know, you mentioned with Eichmann and something he was meeting with Zionists um, throughout the war 
in the yeah, I was like I was going to suggest you uh, talk about the the role of Eichmann because it you know it doesn't really doesn't really set well that uh, this 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 man was um, you well, know God forbid millions metal. of people were killed and, and saying it's a tough thing to talk about and uh, on all sides because uh, you know so many people died and lost uh, you know, the right. horrible things that happened so it's a hard thing to talk about when you're saying you want to factually just just the facts you know because i'm more just the facts you know we could interpret what that means and talk ab more about uh historical interpretations we're just saying what, what are the actual facts of what happened the facts of what happened regarding what in particular the transfer agreement or adolf eichmann well that's because right i mean through, through let's i mean before we you know, because I think the transfer agreement goes past Kristallnacht. And, and it, presumably, oh, it, it totally does. It, it um, actually accelerates after Kristallnacht. It accelerates significantly. And Hitler's like, that is it. This is not working. We are not getting on like we should be getting on. These Jews have got to, we've got to get them out of here. Let's facilitate this more. And it was, in fact, the British blockade and the entry of America into World War II that it ends. So it was the British... Who's well, also the fact that Jews didn't really want to go to Israel. So I mean, if, if Hitler and the Germans had figured that the Jews will go to Israel, but factually the Jews didn't actually want to go to Israel. Right. And that should be a shocking fact for most people. Well, because it goes okay, against in, the in, a lot of narratives. I mean, obviously, people right. have narratives to support current political structures. Exactly. What factually occurred. So, so I would ask the question, and Ingrid Veckert does ask this question, if it was so bad for the Jews up to 1938, like it was nonstop persecution, discrimination, random murder, etc., as we're generally told in the newspapers and whatnot, why didn't they want to leave? No, I mean, because usually Crystal Night is the turning point. There were bad things. Jews knew it was looking bad, but generally Crystal Knack was the turning point yes. for the Jews. For the yes. Jews, where it's like, oh, God forbid, we're going to get killed. Um, exactly. So just to answer your other question, um, after 1945, from Warburg Bank in Hamburg and Bosserman Bank in Berlin, monies for the transfer agreement that was deposited there were paid out in full to the owners. So this went well beyond the 1938, 19. 39, et cetera, the um, transfer agreement officially ended because of British blockading of the channels, closing off immigration to Palestine under British mandate. So they end it. They terminate the whole thing. They make it impossible unless it's illegal immigration, which also, also took place. And Hitler was fully behind illegal immigration too, as well as Adolf Eichmann. He was one of the architects of the illegal immigration with the SS and the Gestapo that took place during that war, after 1941, also during, but mostly after 1941, because it wasn't possible to do this legally any, anymore, and they couldn't get the same funding they had before. So those and, those and Eichmann, we know Eichmann's taking bribes from Zionists through the end of the war, basically that that uh, till the end of the war that there had been Zionists who somehow were capable of walking straight into Nazi Germany meeting mm -hmm. with Eichmann in his office and transferring yes. him decently large sums of money. I'm not sure how much entailed actual bribery, how much of it was told to the official government. Like did Eichmann inform Hitler of what was going on? As far as I know, the NSDAP was informed about these approaches. I don't think it was just limited to Adolf Eichmann as a person, but yes, that happened. And that's documented in the secret roads by the Kimshe brothers in detail. And, you know, Veckert talks about that as well, but they got their money. The Nazis never cheated these Jews who deposited that money for the sole purpose of transferring it to Palestine for the Zionist project. So they were paid out in 1945 after this whole thing came crashing down. Their money was still safe there. The Nazis never seized it. They did freeze it for a while, but they never seized it and it was eventually paid out. And so the documentary so, evidence is so strong of this transfer agreement, but was there an active effort to uh, kind of erase the transfer agreement from history or is it just in the U.S. and Israel and Zionism that they over that they try not to talk about it? Or was there an actual effort to kind of purge this unholy alliance uh, from the from the books? 
I would say there was definitely a blackout and that, okay, first of all, we have the assassination of Rudolf Kasner, who worked intimately with Adolf Eichmann. By his fellow um, Jews in Israel. Exactly. He was assassinated. And I have a feeling it's because he was talking a little too much and there was too much being exposed. Um, I believe it was a a liberal Israeli journalist that was going after him on the basis that he had worked with the Nazis. Well, just for the main storyline, it is a fact that uh, Katzner, I mean, one thing, his granddaughter is in the Knesset today and it's extremely controversial. Interesting. Um, and you're <laughs> largely Katzner. It's, it, it's interesting because in Israel, Katzner is probably considered a hero of World War II, but you know, the strong Zionist Israel that right. he's really remembered as a hero. Um, but the, he did testify on behalf of multiple Nazis in uh, yes, their, he did. in their war crimes trials, and uh, I mean he was assassinated by fellow fellow Jews, and he was originally found guilty of war crimes in Israel, and then the case was overturned before mm -hmm. he was assassinated, and then his compatriot uh, Becker, um, I forget exactly, you know Becker. Katzner's main Nazi uh, yeah he was an SS man. was 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 Becker. Who, right. uh, I mean, he he had dealt with Eichmann, but mostly he dealt with Becker, and then he testifies on behalf. And I think Becker maybe spends a few years in prison, or or is actually uh, um, completely let off for any war crimes af after the war. Correct. And so, so, you know, there's different elements, and and from an internal Jewish perspective, they say you know, God forbid, from the strongest, uh, you know, Notori Karta Hungarian, even Elie Wiesel's writes about that and saying, God forbid. Uh, the, you know, the blood of 400,000 Hungarian Jews is on the hands of the Zionists uh, due to uh, poor poor decisions that uh, the Hungarians were not going to deport the Jews. Uh, the information was there. There was no reason for the Hungarian Jews to, to die except for these continued uh, Zionist cooperation together with the Nazis and, and even bribing, you know, God forbid, money that was used to uh, fund the Holocaust came from the Zionist, uh, you know, and they, they ended up saving the Satma Rebbe and the Katzner train. And, you know, mm -hmm. this is extremely popular Israeli history. And, uh, you know, so in Israel history books, Katzner is a huge hero and, you know, like a founding father of the state and has said his uh, granddaughter, um, I, I forget her name exactly, is actually a member of Knesset right now. Very interesting. I didn't know that about his granddaughter. Uh, yeah, it depends on what perspective you're looking at this from, because according to that 1944 Platterhoff speech that Hitler delivers behind completely closed doors, it was a totally private speech not meant for public consumption. He does not talk about extermination or extirpation of the Hungarian Jews at all. He wants them transferred for the sole purpose of labor because it was so desperately needed. And that's exactly what he says. And he def Defends his decision to his audience. It's a fascinating speech. I'll send you a copy of that if you want to read it. Um, because if any kind of extermination is going to be mentioned, it should be mentioned there by Hitler, but it's not. He says, I know you might not understand this, but they're vital to the labor issue. So I don't know how much of um, the Jewish death numbers can be attributed to just the situation breaking down versus deliberate systematic extermination of those people. That's still debated. Well, even according to Netanyahu, I mean, historically, the Evian conference is when the Nazis decide that they're, God forbid, the Jews are going to be killed. And from what I understand, there was actually two half Jews at the Evi two half Jews, Nazi officers at the Evian conference. Um, in, in and now, are you referring to the um, the Vonzi conference, Vonze? Yeah, Vonzi was where Eichmann and because I'm thinking the Avian was uh, when they decided to like the the Nazis okay. wanted to have Jewish immigrants go I'll to the countries that were receptive. I'm referring to the conference where, God forbid, they they decide to that's the Vonzi kill, to kill the Jews. Allegedly, the Vons yeah, conference. that's that's purportedly the Vonze conference, and even, uh, even according to Netanyahu, mm -hmm. openly said it and was you know big public debate. Almost every Holocaust historian disagreed, but Netanyahu openly said that the Nazis had no intention to kill the Jews, and it was only after meeting with the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem who convinced the Nazis to you know that they to exterminate the Jews. And I'm not sure if you remember that controversy when Netanyahu said that a few years ago. No, I yeah, do remember I, that. I, I remember, yeah. Okay, and there is um, an author 
Oh, Bernard. I can't think of the name of, um, I can't think of his name off the top of my head. Uh, I will find that for you though. I have it in, I believe it's in Black Nazis, where he documents that the Grand Mufti had directly proposed that Hitler bomb Tel Aviv. He wanted an Axis full-blown assault to kill as many Jews as possible and just destroy this fledgling Jewish state building there. And Hitler flat out refused. Does that mean, according to the, I don't want to call it conspiracy, but say that there had been reasonable opinion like that the Zionists until the Vanzi conference were working pretty closely together with the Nazis in terms of uh, you know, mutual enemies of the British and trying to help the Jews liberate Palestine from the British as a military alliance and that, mm -hmm. and that uh, somehow that goes bad and just not working out and uh, the Germans have to change course from what had originally been a deportation plan to God forbid a uh, extermination plan but the, there's no records i mean there's obviously historical anti-semitism and the precedents for europe and people maybe always god forbid wanted to exterminate the jews but the nazis intention it, it, until the until the late 30s 40s it always been deportation that they had planned yeah well the von Z protocol that's still disputed by historians um ingrid Becker brings that up because she says what's interesting is that there's only one figure that derives from an official German source, and we're talking about that von Zee protocol, but it's rejected by establishment authors because it just seems too high. So they'll accept everything from the German documentation or the Nazi documentation except that. So this then proves that there was a German plan for Jewish extermination. So yeah, they had mentioned that 537,000 Jews had emigrated um, in October by October 31st, 1941. So she wants to know why they're cherry picking the numbers. Okay, so let's talk about Crystal Knight. I mean, the transfer agreement is pretty, pretty important. It's you know definitely have to understand from from any perspective, from a Jewish perspective, who's mm -hmm. just trying to understand Zionism. Or from an anti-Zionist, you know, if I'm telling someone actually Zionism is a heresy, and it's not right. such a good thing, and, and I mean, like Zionism's, the, you know, the word Zion comes from the Bible, and has messianic implications uh, related to the Jews returning to Israel, and that's why the Zionists uh, chose to call their movement Zionism, because of the historic precedents in the Bible related to the term and the ingathering of the Jews. Um, right. But also to you know German nationalists or people just trying to understand World War II or the Holocaust, um, in the type poor decisions that people made or, or just historically how these things came out. But but I mean, St. Crystal Knight's the big turning point, and uh, I didn't know how much it was disputed. And I only started looking into these things a few years ago, and it said like mm -hmm. I hadn't heard of Herschel Greenspan until a few years ago, and. Uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting points uh, about about you know what happened, what was the not you know most Holocaust historians will say that the Nazis organized Crystal Knight but then pretended like they didn't, or it was an organic uh, uprising, or if there had been some Zionists together that had somehow God forbid worked together uh, with that, and then the financial implications because I know uh, I think the Jews had to pay fines for crystal nights. I mean, I mean, from a Jewish perspective, God forbid we, all these bad things happen to us and then they footed us the bill for it. Right. Um, it's disputed because nobody knows who in fact put out the order to touch off crystal night. And there is absolutely zero proof that Goebbels or Hitler ordered it. There's nothing. There's only purported eyewitness testimony. There is a Jewish historian named uh, Steinweiss. I think it's Alan Steinweiss, 48 Hours of Crystal Night, if I'm recalling that correctly. And he talks about two people, like he, he pins this on two individuals in the SA, Johann Heinrich Binker and his SA subordinate Riempagel. I don't believe we're ever given Rimpagel's first name. And Ingrid Veckert said 
there was one essay like official as it were um i believe his name was hans luke that's l u c k e he's the one who purportedly put out this report to destroy synagogues and touch this off but no one can find that so it's all being pinned on him and she's saying this is a problem because we don't have the report and he's saying that he's innocent of the charges well then steinweiss comes in and says no no it was this johann heinrich bimker guy and his subordinate that were the ones who made that initial order so if you will just permit me to read just a short excerpt from the crystal knight book that okay, can I mention, before you do that, can I mention something I'm just yeah just, it's it's likely that you know, that like in terms of riots or anti-Semitism was extremely strong. And, you know, the survivors I know from Crystal Knight, uh -huh. you know, tell the stories or say that everyone kind of came out and watched. And uh, you said so there weren't necessarily orders to uh, destroy Jewish things, that it was organic, that the German people you know, just culminated and, and, and did this without necessarily an order. But the orders were to not put out the fires, to not stop them and that the fire department stood by and uh, you know put out the fires if it came onto german property but didn't put out the fires and that uh, you know the people who survived crystal night they watched it and it was like a community event where everyone in the town was you know watching these things happen and the police and fire departments were there there standing by so the orders may not have been to uh destroy the property but the, that could have been organic uh uprising of the german people against the jews but the order to not stop them to not persecute them and to not put mm -hmm. out the fires was the actual um, directive order uh the direct order that came from hitler that ingrid Vecker can support fully with an actual letterhead from his office is that this has to stop he called for an immediate halt of the chaos that was ensuing that comes straight from hitler and he was outraged but Hitler so, had been the funeral of von Rath. Was, was it the same day that von Rath died, and Hitler was actually at that funeral? No, this is when it actually started. This is when he was informed about synagogues being on fire, and there's some kind of riot going on. But I and understand. He said, what the hell's going on? Stop it! Whatever it is, stop it. So it happened, this is after the, the night, fact. It, it happened the night of von Rath's funeral. The crystal I mean, on the beer went push. on for on actually three days. Actually, it started before Fum Rath died. I mean, from the mm -hmm. the fifteen year anniversary of the Beer Putsch Hall uprising, and there right. had been a Hitler had spoken that night on the anniversary, and they had one of these like midnight mass initiations Correct. of new soldiers, and uh, but the damages weren't largely done by soldiers; they were done by generic Germans. But but just saying that the fire departments and police did stand by it in you're saying that there was order for them to stop it and they didn't yes listen, or it's yeah, there were there were incidents many many incidents where the ss was retrieving the goods being thrown out onto the street and taking them back into the synagogue securing jews against attacks and uh the fire department was putting out the fires that they could of jewish property this is all documented yeah, so there's literally have, film. There's literally film of the uh, you know, firefighters putting out fires and whatnot. And Goering, uh, Goering, I, I forget where I read about this, but uh, Goering was freaking out because of all his friends in the uh, <laughs> all his business ties to people in the insurance business. They were looking at uh, you know uh, in some you know a, a much nationalized insurance companies um, having to pay out God knows how much in claims for broken glass and burnt buildings and whatnot they they would they didn't want that to happen it was a well, just so we get i mean because i definitely right. want to understand how, how the jews like financially what, what we're charged with what we have to pay for but there were like 20 30 000 jews who were taken um away for some even a few months you know the local man here said his father was gone for three months after that and uh and there was a confiscation of weapons from jews that happened during that also right Correct. That's when they took away the guns. So that would have been when the gun laws were actually modified. But they actually went house to house. So it, it, that set off a point where the SS went 
house to house the Jews, confiscated weapons, and took uh, tens of thousands of uh, adult Jewish males away for questioning. Yes, that is purported by the eyewitness testimony. And there were, of course, instances of that. But it, as far as I know from Ms. Veckert, all of them ended up coming back unless something happened in the interim, like if they suffered a heart attack during this event, or if there was just a SA man who murdered a random Jewish person. But those people were punished. Anybody who acted against a Jew to murder them, to beat them, to hurt them, they were punished by the Reich court. So that's where Steinweiss tries to, like the, um, the thesis he puts out to explain this is that the Nazis were trying to engage in something called um, plausible deniability, that they were just mock or fake persecuting the SA men and the SS men who did engage in any kind of thievery or beatings or killings, God forbid, um, that that was just the NSDAP doing a show trial against its own to make it look like it was a real legit punishment for these people. But there were a lot of SA men and SS men who were put in jail for what they'd done and had their posts stripped their rank stripped and they weren't allowed to be in the SA or the SS anymore as a result for, of what they did. That, that was for cases of rape or something. There were a few cases of uh, German yes. soldiers, Jewish women. Uh, yeah, this would have been, I don't believe any soldiers participated. It was the SS and the SA in particular, mainly the SA, the Sturmabteilung. And yes, there were a, a, a one documented rape that uh, Veckert points out. That man was he was punished severely and had his SA rank completely stripped and but, he I mean, was Hitler's banished a, from the SA. Hitler's official statement, and it seemed the Nazis official statement in the newspapers that, you know, this was a bad thing. We didn't have anything to do with it. We tried to stop it as quickly as possible, but mm -hmm. it was justifiable anger against the Jewish people specifically related to the murder of von Raff. You know, it was like a straw that broke the camel back and you just couldn't stop the masses from carrying out their uh, um, natural, justified anger against the Jewish people, and the government did everything they could to stop it as soon as possible. Um, it, I mean, Goebbels does hint at that, yes. Um, he's saying, while it's understandable that this reaction would take place, um, it, this is not the way to solve the Jewish question. So in private, he's saying one thing like, oh, my God, this is really bad. This is not going to be good for us. And in the paper, in order to mitigate this situation, he's saying, yeah, I understand why, you know, the average German citizen is very angry. Uh, you're justifiably acting out your aggression for this terrible assassination. So you have to compare and contrast what he's saying publicly versus what he's saying in private. The Nazis did not, in fact, know what in the heck happened. They really well, they, didn't. And, and they were certainly concerned about uh, their image uh, internationally oh, yeah. in the court of public opinion. They did not want the entire world, um, you know. Well, they're looking, I mean, France is the main concern. Can we get into Greenspan and, Van, and Van Raff the, it to say right. that, I mean, the storyline is like, that's the, um, that there's some sort of Jewish conspiracy trying to cause divisions between the French and the Germans and related to Greenspan and in, in Germany wanting the extradition of Greenspan or, or, or whatever, whatever understanding of the storyline, why, why the murder of Van Rath was such a big deal. And uh, I think this carries out and saying, do you know much with the funeral? I, I understand that Hitler was at his funeral. If that was a big thing, his funeral was like a national ceremony that all the papers would have covered. Oh, there's no doubt the Nazis capitalized on it, of course, because it was just case in point where we Jews and Germans aren't getting along here. Or we Germans and Jews, actually, from the Nazi perspective. It look, we have an French assassination. the French didn't have much of a problem with the, at that point, the French didn't seem to have much of a problem with the Jews. And they didn't, they weren't right. even cooperative in the right. trial. Because they didn't have a reason to be. They didn't have this anti-Jewish policy, which is really at the heart of the NSDAP. 
they wanted they were anti-jewish hitler was anti-jewish and wanted them removed from germany so in the french case they didn't have that foundational precept in their politics so of course they weren't they weren't just going to go along with what germany wanted especially when they're essentially enemies yeah they were more opposed than not i looked at the map and saying there were like hundreds of synagogues burnt and destroyed i mean the crystal night was all all across germany like Yes, it was. I think thousands of Jewish businesses, even historic uh, businesses that have been around for uh, you know hundreds of years, possibly, were completely destroyed. That that thing. This was some sort of. Uh, I mean, it was it was a built up uh, pressure that had been in Germany a long time that happened that night, and this uh, murder of Van Rath was what uh, got the attention and led to. Uh, this change in events and saying the condition of the Jews changed uh, significantly after, right. after uh, Kristallnacht. And one can look at it from both perspectives. And this is what we do in our book, the Crystal Night 1938 Nazi pogrom or Zionist scheme from the Nazi perspective. They not only get to take the Jews guns away and they're justified in doing so based on the situation, because they thought that maybe Jews were behind this they thought it was a conspiracy against them by the Zionists or some other Jewish organization. I mean, God forbid there's going to be like mass assassinations that any Jew with a gun might start assassinating Germans. Right, people. exactly. German so we people. have to, yeah, exactly. So we have to understand the German perspective. Like they don't know what in the heck's going on. They think that this is an anti-German action on the part of international Jewry, perhaps, with some kind of agents and agencies or groups that are working in their behalf against the German government. Because remember, Hitler's at the height of his power. This is post-Munich agreement. He is riding high. And then all of a sudden, we're supposed to believe that he threw it all to Hades with this crystal night nonsense, when he's the one who said, Oh my God, they're, they've destroyed everything for me, like elephants in a china shop. That's how he reacted to Crystal Knight. He thought this was a devastating blow, and he told Goebbels, fix it. And so Hitler believed that Goebbels had done this. That's why most historians, including David Irving, to this day pin the blame on Joseph Goebbels. When you talk about the fake journal entry, I looked on mine and it had like this handwritten in english and it seemed really weird because i'm looking at this evidence of uh it was a goebbels diary entry mm -hmm. and then i'm looking like he wouldn't have written in english and, and they have it even written out like it's a diary entry in english and i was like <laughs> and i'm trying to think and, and you mentioned there's some kind of conspiracy that 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 journal entry of goebbels is forged oh yes okay so um the only thing the only piece of primary evidence that can possibly pin this on Goebbels is in the possession of the Russians to this day. It's in their archives. It is the plate glass copies of Goebbels' original diaries. The November 1938 entries are missing from every single Goebbels diary record that exists in German and English, including the actual ones that I obtained from the IFZ that were published by the IFZ with their approval and everything. Those are the only entries that are missing. So David Irving is the only historian who claims to have seen those plate, bla plate glass copies of the 1938 entries. And he says, Goebbels did it. I have the proof. I saw the plate glass copies. Ingrid Vecker asked David Irving, can I please see those? You know, you got copies of this. Can I please see that evidence to to assess it because she was trying to write her book Flashpoint about Crystal Knight. He refused. He would not show her that and denied her that evidence. So David Irving is harboring a secret that he has not told to any other historian. And he wrote a book pinning it specifically on Dr. Goebbels saying that Goebbels was basically this evil mastermind behind Crystal Knight. And he destroyed everything for Hitler and the NSDAP with that event. But Goebbels' own testimony, as per the eyewitness accounts that were with him and his own personal adjutant, contradict this. And nobody's seen those plate glass entries, and now the Russians have locked down their archive. No one's allowed to look at any of that stuff, and they started arresting historians who were doing, quote-unquote, revisionism in Russia. 
by using their archives. So I, I put it on screen share because I had done, this is from a Holocaust museum and the history and I'd done a stream on it and, and it has the timeline of uh, you know, okay. no, November 9th. Can you see my screen share? Yes. So I mean, you have Goebbels, um, the, your er, Ernest Van Raff dies at 5.30 Right. And incidentally, the rioting started before Ernst von Rath died. It is a myth that the rioting started after he died that night. There were instances of a, um, destruction of Jewish property and harassment of Jews before that. So and it, it went on longer than historians suggest. It wasn't just the night of November 9th, 10th. It lingered. It was like a three day thing. What well, what the speech Goebbels November 9th, nine thirty to ten Goebbels gives a speech to Nazi officials, and according to most purportedly yeah according to the uh, Holocaust historians that's where he actually told them to do what he did and I'll show you like because because it, it seemed kind of shady right. and, and right. you have uh, Heinrich Mueller also has a uh, um, yes Gestapo Miller. As yeah, so he's famously for, for whatever known. reason, you know, like I'm looking at this. This is uh, the English, you know, supposedly Goebbels diary entry, and it just doesn't make sense. Like if it's in English, they should just say it. I don't know why it's written in cursive, and you know, like it doesn't make sense that they have this is Goebbels diary entry in uh, in English like that. And, and then, right. but the Himmler's notified 11:30. Um, you know, he's together with Hitler, and, and according to the you know, most Holocaust historians, Himmler sends instructions to the Gestapo right. and SS that they should not participate in the violence, um, although the, the arrests, and then... Uh, That's actually incorrect right there. Text, it, it, was, there it was Reinhard Heydrich who purportedly told them to arrest wealthy Jews, and he gave a specific number. I mean, he literally said, I want you to arrest between... I don't know it off the top of my head, like 10,000 to 15,000 Jews. It, it, who, who was keeping count of this? Because this was supposed to be off the cuff, like totally unplanned, right? How are they going to know that they've arrested exactly 15,000 Jews or whatever the case is? And then also, how are Heydrich and Gestapo Müller depending on the average essay bumpkin to know who is and isn't a wealthy Jew while this craziness is going on. Well, there it is. It 20 to 30,000 Jews throughout the Reich. Does That's this it. exist or not? I'm saying, that, I mean, if these were, uh, these telexes telexes are forged by the allied psychological warfare division. Ingrid Veckert proved it indefatigably. She is a document expert and she's also fluent in Hebrew. Her book, Flashpoint. It's called Feuerzeichen in German. It was like literally every single copy of this book was confiscated and destroyed by the German government when it came out and her house was searched. They seized her computer and everything. I'm not kidding you. This happened to the historian that exposed this. So there's some, there's definitely something being suppressed about Crystal Knight. Now, if you look at it from the Zionist perspective, they definitely benefit from this. What about, do you know anything about Wilhelm Krutzfeld, who supposedly breaks Nazi orders to save the new synagogue of, uh, I don't know what place that was, but supposedly there had been one Nazi officer that broke orders and saved a synagogue. Well, he wouldn't have been breaking orders. He would have been following orders because mm -hmm. the actual orders that aren't part of these fake telexes that were created after the fact, post facto by the allies for the IMT, the International Military Tribunal, the orders were, you guys have got to put out the fires. You need to secure whatever is being thrown out onto the street. Um, Jews who request to be put into protective custody, you will do so. You will protect them against any kind of attacks. Those are the real orders that went out. And of course, Veckert has all of that documented. She quotes extensively from the primary sources, from Heydrich, from Himmler. And in fact, Himmler thought Goebbels did it. He's like that imbecile. This is, uh, this is unbelievable. 
So Himmler didn't even know what was going on. <laughs> so how th that's you know the main thing I want to understand here, and you know at least how would the Jews get assessed for the damages? Like how did it come from after Kristallnacht to to a punitive fine of a billion Reichsmarks, about four hundred million in nineteen thirty eight, uh, you know, right, billions of dollars imposed on the Jewish community for what happened on Crystal Night. Yeah, Ingrid Vecker gets into that too. Um, I'll, I'll take it off uh, screen share, but but I, I you know, done. Yeah. Uh, um, because this is the thing. There were Dutch businesses, and I believe there were also French businesses that were completely destroyed. So how come the stupid SA guys that were supposed to be targeting solely Jewish businesses screwed up so bad and destroyed a bunch of Dutch and other foreign national businesses. That doesn't make any sense. Um, as far as the insurance thing, I don't know the exact details of that um, right off the top of my head, but let me just find that section. Uh, really quickly, before I do that, um, if anybody wants to know who the man on the telephone that ge uh, purportedly gave the orders, Ingrid Veckert asks that question, and she was never able to identify who it was. So she asks, who was the man on telephone duty in the Monheim Brown Shirt group who accepted the command to attack Jews? That question has to be answered. Now, as far as what Steinbeck You're saying, God forbid, you could say it could have been a Zionist? I mean, is that possible? Is that what you're saying? And I'm saying a, that is... How is it a Zionist conspiracy? How could it have been? I mean, obviously, because the Zionists got a certain portion of the money that was confiscated from Jews, and right. maybe that they wanted to give uh, push the Jews that they should come to Israel. Um, right. But, I'm you know, saying look, that's possible. You could have had some kind of traitor in there. It is a fact that Weizsäcker, who was the... Um, he was in the foreign office for Germany in Britain. So he was part of that. Um, I can't think of his first name off the top of my head. Is it Franz Weizsäcker? That man did everything in his power to sabotage the Havara Agreement. He also sabotaged a little known agreement called the Ruble Voltat Agreement that was financed by American Jews to get Jews to the United States and other destinations other than Palestine. He sabotaged it all and didn't tell Hitler about any of the proposals. So it is very possible that the entity, the anonymous entity that gave this order was some kind of agent or plant. That is possible. We don't know because it's still a mystery. But what I can tell you is that according to Steinweiss's account, he did some real diligent digging at the IFZ. And he says that the point man that Veckert is looking for is either an SA man named Johann Heinrich Bimker or his subordinate Rimpagel. So first of all, Bimker was present at that old town hall meeting that night, and he purportedly heard Goebbels' address on the evening of the 9th. Bimker was a party old fighter. He was one of the former Stolstrup people since the mid-20s. Casting further suspicion on Mr. Bimker is the point man. <clears throat> As the point man who got this whole mess started, Steinweiss wrote, here's what this Jewish um, author literally wrote. When Goebbels finished speaking, Bimker rushed to the telephone to convey Goebbels' instructions to his subordinates in Bremen. Bimker's call was received by his chief of staff, a man named Rimpagel. So we don't even know if Rimpagel is an invention. This guy has no first name, and no one other than Steinweiss has looked at this documentation. So this could be more allied fabrication. We have no idea. Bimker told Limpagel that the Bremen SA was to destroy all Jewish businesses immediately. The fire department should be allowed to intervene only when fires threatened, quote unquote, Aryan property. Why they would use the term Aryan in this instance is bizarre to me. The police were not to interfere at all. Yet the police did interfere. And that's what's so telling that there's something crazy going on here. Bimker was em emphatic on this point. The fear desires that the police not interfere. Finally, Bimker ordered the SA and Blamen to confiscate all weapons from Jews. 
should just mount resistance, they should be quote unquote gunned down. Those are his exact words. There is no evidence whatsoever that Hitler, Goebbels, or Himmler ordered any of this, especially gunning Jews down, which didn't happen anyway. I mean, that those were random occurrences if it did happen, if a Jewish person was shot during these events. That was very, very uh, rare. That was an anomaly during this thing. Most of them were just put into protective custody. So, uh, so let me find that insurance thing for you. Um, anyway, I, I still don't understand how how does this become assessed to the Jews to pay for the destruction of the yeah. Own? I'm it, going. I'm going to find that insurance part because it's. <laughs> may, may, it's you know, while you're doing that, maybe go on. You know, because like, you within the next uh, few months. We're going to see that uh, you, Germany takes over France in the deportation of uh, Greenspan. That's supposed to be like the trial of the century that uh, Germany, one of their main consideration when they ca uh, capture France is to have uh, Greenspan deported or you mm -hmm. know, brought to Germany and to stand trial and executed. And then he comes up with this homosexual defense that uh, seems to save his life. And I guess at that point, Greenspan, was he important or was he not? Okay, he, the trial of Greenspan seemed to be extremely important to Germany. And that was uh, that in uh, you know the fiasco of uh, his accusations. I'm not sure if you researched that history much. As far as Greenspan's defense? Yeah, because it was supposed to be like the trial of the century. They were supposed to bring in Greenspan right. to Germany. He had been someone that had been being protected and you know should have been executed for his crimes. And then they get him and they start to stand trial. And he gives right. this defense like, no, no, he didn't assassinate Roth because of anything to do with uh, Judaism or Jewish persecution. It was a personal thing that him and Van Roth had, had a homosexual relationship that turned sour. Right. Um, as far as I know, that was one line of defense that, of course, um, the defenders of Greenspan were willing to roll with. But it was but it, it, he had a famous attorney that the, the Rabbi Hall. Yeah, Moro Gioffrey. Or OK, so it incidentally. Mr. Greenspan, when he was living with his uncle, used to pass by the LICA Lika office every day. It was the League for the Protection of European Jews or something like that in France. I don't know if you're familiar with the LICA, L-I-C-A. No, unfortunately not. Okay, it's kind of like, I guess you'd equate it mostly to the ADL today, but there oh, was okay. an office it right there, and Moro Gioffrey was affiliated with it. So Ingrid Vecker says there's a very strong circumstantial case that Glinspan's handlers were the Lika. And Moro Gioffrey took advantage of that whole situation. So, and this would again have been for the benefit of the Zionists. And that may have been why Glinspan was never put on this show trial that was supposed to happen because the Nazis realized this. Maybe Glinspan talked to them and we never got that information. So we have no idea what was said behind closed doors once he was incarcerated because he was put in a jail in Germany, not in a concentration camp. So what did he tell the German authorities, his captors, while he was there? And was perhaps he used as like a bargaining chip by the Zionists? Did the Nazis preserve his life for the sake of the Zionist cause? Do we see how that can be just as valid a circumstantial case where the Zionists were responsible as opposed to the Nazis being responsible or the Nazis somehow taking advantage of this Jewish individual. And there is, of course, the story that he changed his identity and that he got new papers or whatever, and he ended up in Israel. So that's another possibility that we may never have answers, definitive answers to these questions. Is this one of the first mobilizations? I mean, because Crystal Night happens before um, the annexation of Poland, right? Correct. So was this one of the first semi uh, mobilizations of a military sense 
of the German people, Crystal Knight, or had there been uh, well other similar you know mass violence uh, operations across? No, that that was it. The only thing that could possibly be presented as part of this continuum, which that one rabbi does in that talk about Herschel Grinspan, is when the Polish visa ordinance thing was taking place and the Germans were like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. We have to literally get all these Jews living here that haven't updated their visas on the border to do this update and then they can come back. So that was a mass roundup that was organized by Reinhard Heydrich, but we have to understand the motive was just to make sure their paperwork was up to date. Otherwise, they would have magically become stateless people living in Germany, and then it's Germany's problem. And the crazy thing about this whole roundup that took place because of a Polish legislative action in 38 was that the Nazis were blamed for it. And the Poles wouldn't even take their own Jewish citizens back. They would not allow them to cross that border. And they were like, too late. So there was real madness going on. And on the Polish side, there was uh, like a holding camp there. That camp existed through the entire war in Poland. And some of those Jews were never let out of there. So he doesn't talk about the Polish side of this whole thing in that talk. That it was really Poland that was responsible for this roundup that Herschel Glinspan purportedly used as his motive, like his real motive, for the assassination of Vom Rath in an act of revenge against the Nazis rounding up his family because they were part of this ordinance chaos. Because Poland didn't want them back. And so when they came in to... That's exactly I mean, what Germany the case wanted was. wanted to deport the Polish... Uh, Jews that were in Germany at the time, and there were like 15,000 rounded up. I mentioned the, the famous Avram Yeshua Heschel, who came to America and became a big conservative rabbi, and much right. Dr. King was also part of that group. And there were other famous people that, you know, within the Jewish community who went on to become famous. But yeah, I mean, Poland uh, puts them in a camp and they don't uh, accept, they don't want those Jews coming back into Poland. Exactly. So why does Herschel Grinspan want to take out his revenge on the Germans instead of the Poles? And mind you, that was his family's homeland. They were from Poland, not Germany. And the other thing that is a very important question well, to ask... Well, migration-wise, your average Polish Jew had a better lot in Germany because we talked about the population but see, it, it, this explosion, is, but the immigration pressure was for right. Jews to have a better economic opportunity to move from Poland into Germany. Right, but they were still doing economically better in Nazi Germany and preferred Nazi Germany to Poland at that time. This should be striking to anybody hearing it. Was well, I mean, just a simple economic answer that even with the anti-Semitism, the Nazis in power, exactly. just, the, just the social economic status of being a Jew in Germany was- It was uh, still preferable to living in Poland. I mean, that to me is a pretty remarkable fact that um, the Jewish historians are going to have to address that. They're going to have to address it. And by the way, Ingrid Veckert has proven that Herschel Grinspan's father was receiving welfare stipends from the Nazi government at that time. You bet. He was getting welfare. Yeah, I mean, these things are pretty complicated. In, they are in complicated. Piecing it all together. And, and uh, you know, maybe, maybe you know, th thank God we got over 20 people now, a lot of these people, that you're familiar with them from the past. I don't know, you know, some people are questioning your scholarship in the chat. I don't know how much they know of you, but uh, you maybe we could talk about something more interesting to the general audience than World War II history and the relationship to nationalism and race and uh, racial identity, identitarianism today. Mm -hmm. I know you did a lot of research on the origins of the German people and say the German people are a mix of what you said, six different races or in uh, you know, the Aryanism. We talk about colorism. Also, um, I, I've, the reports that Himmler stopped executions of Jews when, when there were people with like blonde hair and blue eyes and would question them if they had German blood and then if in, in occasionally remove uh, Jews from these executions because of Aryan blood. I'm not sure if you're familiar with those stories. Um, I have heard of some 
related stories like that um, in Brian Riggs' work. But uh, what I can tell you is it's that pretty, pretty well documented by collaborating evidence. I mean, it's in uh, Hilberg's uh, destruction, but but it happened on multiple occasions. There, you right. witnesses where the you know, the mass executions by shootings before the Holocaust, but when they, when they were coming into the territory and by shootings that they would uh, pick out and question Jews who had light features. And there are even people that survived the war and talk about the experience of uh, being picked out of the crowd and living. See, I, I don't know. That seems weird to me because if subordinate soldiers, just your quote unquote grunts are ordered to mass execute, how can they act on their own initiative to save Jews of blonde hair and blue eyes? I, I'm just not understanding how they can defy a grunt order like well, that. Or Mischling or something like that, because I think that, that they actually questioned them. So that if there was, you know, God forbid that they came into the town and they marched the Jews out and they're about to shoot them, mm -hmm. that and they notice, okay, there's a few people that are blonde hair and blue eyes. Uh, let's speak to them before we, you know, did, did the atrocity. And they would ask them if they had German blood in them, that if they were Mischling. And if they were Mischling, they would have been removed. That, I I don't know. I find that questionable. I'd have to look at these actual eyewitness accounts. Like I said, I've never read Hilberg's book. So I've only looked at aspects of it through like revisionist quotings where like Guillermo Rudolph is dissecting um, different parts of the book. But uh, I don't know. I just, I find that strange. Because according to the Nazi racial laws themselves, like what they were actually saying and legislating, there was no blonde haired, blue eyed obsession. That is a myth. Well, so they meant sounds... Aryan blood. So the person would have been questioned. So I mean, a Michelin right. who, I mean, this, I was just reading Bryant uh, last night. I got one of his books. So the Michelin's, if they had Aryan blood in them, they were German. Oh, right then they would have uh, possibly been saved. They would have been, even been subject to the draft. Um, however, if they were Michelin of Polish blood or a different European blood, then mm -hmm. you were considered full Jewish. So it wasn't just like, oh, you're, you could be a full Jew and phenotypically had light features, that they, that, but if they had, uh, uh, wasn't the same as if they actually had Aryan blood in them. So you had a lot of Jews that were maybe to save their life or maybe actually did have Aryan blood in them. And that, you know, you'd think that they would stop the battlefield, that, you know, something happening on the battlefield, and it would be important enough to stop everything to uh, try to uh, save these Michelin that might have some German blood in them. Well, according to Rigg, I mean, he gave a really good lecture about it. He said that a lot of the superior officers that were German, like German German, knew about the Michelin under their command, and they never said anything. So even when there were supposed to be discharges going on of Mischlinge as Hitler flip-flopped all over the place, and then, you know, he'd say, okay, they're, they're back in, no, they're out, they're in, they're out. They were all over the map with this because there were so many competing factions amongst the upper echelons regarding Mischling policy and exceptions. And most of these stories- They admit been, though that they ignored it. 1941, I would say most of these stories would have been before the camps were open and when they were conquering the territory in, in you know 41 or 40 or 42 well the there's instances of jewish soldiers the Mischling soldiers who were able to visit uh their relatives in the concentration camps and Even they were also able to secure food ration cards for them through their service so that did happen um, it is pretty outrageous that you have these Jewish people serving in the military and their family members are in concentration camps. That's inexcusable on the part of the Nazi leadership. I mean, honestly, it's just inexcusable. So, you know, we're not saying that there wasn't persecution and ridiculousness in that regard, but it wasn't black and white either. There was always this gray area. So, yes, there were instances according to the Michelin soldiers themselves, where they were able to either help relatives in the camps or they were able to stop atrocities against Jews as they were occurring, whether they were spontaneous or ordered. They do claim that in their well, eyewitness there, accounts. Have you ever heard anything about like any, I don't know, any claims that... Uh, are you seeing the chat? Just curious, are you seeing the chat if people are asking you questions? Uh, 
Do, should I ask you questions for you? Uh, sure. Yeah. I'm not actually looking at the chat right now. So yeah, if there's any questions, please feel free. Is my mic working? Yeah, it's yeah. working fine. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Vince. Oh, okay. Um, no, I was going to, I didn't know if, if, Veronica, have you ever heard any instances of any, uh, you know, Jewish soldiers, Michelin soldiers or whatever, um, you know, taking any action to prevent their, you know, family or, or you know, uh, written any accounts of their families being, you know, uh, put into death camps and, and thus exterminated or... You know, well, this is what like Rig, that. yeah, this is what Rig has found when you read his book. Everything about the extermination was only brought to the attention of the Mishlinga after the war. Mm. None of them, except like maybe one or two that he talked to, knew it about extermination. It was a different unit that did that, and the Mishling wouldn't have been put in that unit, just like my Jewish grandfather was sent to Japan. No, I understand that. But I mean, just, you know, I mean, if they were allowed to visit and correspond with their relatives. Yes, I mean, they there, were. Yeah. I mean, are there any cases of, you know, Jewish soldiers in the Wehrmacht or, or whatever, finding out that their, you know, family members had been, uh, you know, had deceased? Only post facto. Okay. Only post facto. And that's in was, Riggs' book. Yeah, I mean, Riggs quotes that it was usually... Um, the full German citizens who saved the Mich the you know, uh, Michelin who uh, had German family who uh, wanted their Jewish uh, blood relatives to be saved. You know, it's like, look, that person might be a Jew, but they're mm -hmm. also my cousin. Right, yeah. right, yeah. There were definitely instances where the Michelin soldiers pulled as many strings as they could to help their family members, but again. None of them, other than maybe one or two individuals that Riggs spoke with, said that they knew of extermination or had witnessed a family member being exterminated in a camp, like receiving a letter that, you know, your loved one is dead or whatever the case right. is. So, yes, that would have been a major anomaly. Yeah. Um, so, um, read a quick, you know, Tom Anderson, who I'm not sure if you know, he's on a lot of these streams. He was asking about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and then Butterfly okay. Fly Away, who's also on a lot of these streams, is asking about the term concentration camps, that the Nazis actually use them. And I, I, I'm not, do you know Brundlefly? Have you streamed with him? I haven't. They did use the term, it's shortened to KZ, Concentrationslagern, which is concentration camps. Yes, yeah, they yeah, use that term. I mean, even extermination camp, if they use that term. To my knowledge, no, they never ever designated officially anything an extermination camp. It was always a KZ. You know much yeah. about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising? Um, I know quite a bit about it. There, sure. were, um, there were there um, were weapons the there were weapons caches that were discovered under uh, I believe it was Lesno Street, close to a prison facility. So the Nazis did have reasonable suspicion about whether, you know, where are these weapons going? Who are these designated for? So it was really what we would describe, like Americans would describe it as an insurrection against an occupation. That's really what it was. So when you're occupying a country and you have a quote unquote Muslim terrorist insurrection, like in Iraq or a terrorist attack is what they're calling them now, it's the same exact thing. So yeah, I mean, it, as far as the Warsaw Uprising, the Jewish participants in that, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, they had every right to resist. That was correct from their perspective. It was an insurrection against what they saw as a, a unjustified occupation of Poland and a persecution of their people. However, I believe, I, you know, I can't remember what general it was. Guderian is popping up in my head, but don't quote me on it. I have this in, I believe it's in Truth for Germany. It's an interview I did with MorningTheAncient.com, and I can send you a link to that interview. But he said there should be no vicious persecution of these people. Like, we need to treat them fairly. And that was agreed. There wasn't going to be any mass killings or massacres of the participants. 
And there were, in fact, a lot of women who participated in that. Also, in the Warsaw Uprising, there were all kinds of different factions participating in that. It wasn't just Poles. So, and there were women fighters as well. So when we have instances of civilians being killed, well, they were participating in this. This was kind of like a little revolutionary insurrectionary act in both cases, in both of these uprisings. So, I mean, if you look at Robert Forreston, he describes the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising as essentially like a police action. So it depends, again, on who's who are you reading? Are you reading like the Jewish perspective or are you reading like the German or the revisionist perspective? There's even a Polish perspective on it. So it depends. Everybody is trying to politicize their side and make it as favorable to their side as possible. So trying to hash out the exact truth of all these things, it's always difficult, mm. especially when you have eyewitnesses who might not be remembering correctly or who are being influenced false memory syndrome, um, that definitely plays a role in all eyewitness accounts. So if, if you have time to, like this uh, this topic is pretty interesting. I, I ordered five of your books and hopefully, you know, I'll even order more and go through. And yeah, I'm not a, too big of a military historian, you, mm -hmm. um, but I, I am curious about nationalism and the, the rise in the history, especially related to your research. And I know there's a extremely famous story um, of a famous rabbi, it, you know, when the um, I went to a school, the, you know, Mir was a town in Poland, and it was largely destroyed. But a lot of the it survived through uh, the Japanese diplomat who gave visas, and they ended up in Japan, and then China, in Shanghai, mm -hmm. through uh, right. know, and, and the Japanese were, I believe, they were ordered to kill the kill the these uh, you know, Jewish prisoners of war, but they decided not to, in uh, you know, just in, in ties for the nationalism that the Japanese official asked uh, the you know this group of rabbis, you know, why do the Germans hate you so much? And uh, you know, the rabbi said because because we're Oriental, you know, the Jews come from Asia and we're part Oriental, and you know, God forbid they hate you just as much as they hate us. And that's a pretty common thing I hear from Jews. And like when I started looking into Indian history. And mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of Chinese and Indian people that, uh, to some extent, they were part of the the, the Axis, and so India was uh, at least uh, you know, the extreme elements that that wanted uh, to liberate themselves for the British allied with the Nazis. So there's a lot of veneration right. of Hitler in India, and a common thing, you know, Jews talking like, "What are you talking about? The, the you know the Nazis were racial supremacists. They would have if they were Indians in." Uh, in Germany, they would have hated them just as much. But but apparently, there were not, there were Indians in the SS. Yeah, I mean, apparently uh, that's not true. The, yeah. the Nazis didn't have necessarily a racial supremacy uh, order to them, and they did. Uh, right. You know, they 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 supported uh, free and independent uh, India in terms of uh, nationalism, yeah. and the German people didn't appear to be imperialists. I don't think they were. You know, the Germans uh, compared to the other major powers in Europe didn't right. have this desire to. Co not to the colonize extent. the not to the colonize. extent. <laughs> yeah, and, and the, just they these, have some imperialistic aspects, but not you know, yeah, not I mean, the interesting. Divide. One thing of the Nazi no, racial law is uh, the unique, you know, view the, of Jews as the enemy of the Aryans. In you know, looking that you know, Japanese, Indian, Chinese, they might be different nations and have their own identities, and they don't want them mass immigrating to their country, but they weren't considered enemies. It was uniquely the Jews and you know then obviously it was a world war so there were allies across uh, the world and all these minorities and you've done a lot of research on this and uh, you know, so I'm, I'm interested in that and you know I've ordered your books that they haven't came in so maybe in a few weeks or a few months if when I have time to go through your books we'll be able to talk again about this but uh, you know anything on that topic is extremely interesting and you know what you said you know, what does it mean Aryan or the different uh, right. racial identity even nationalism in general because a lot of historians think nationalism is a relatively modern invention that uh, you know historically nations were more multicultural Sanherib the king of Persia the Bible mentions that you know when Persia was the main empire that he mixed up and caused intermarriage between all the nations as a military strategy so that they'd be less likely to revolt um, Mm -hmm. 
and, and you know, then you have this rise in the last few hundred years of nation states forming right. nations. And, and you could argue historically whether there was, you know, did we have nationalisms or nation states and multiculturalism? And so yeah, I'm interested to get your expertise and uh, take on that. Well, we've always had multiculturalism insofar as empires are concerned. And this is the thing that gets me about the modern, what I call multi-cult, the white race. And I do include Jewish people in this umbrella of the white race because well, most Ashkenazi Jewish people. certainly, certainly the Ashkenazi Jewish people have every right. If and that's if why I mentioned the, you know, why the population explosion that right. we're close to 1800 years, there were only about a million Jews in the world. Uh -huh. 70, and, and then there's this huge population explosion where 90% of worldwide Jewry are Ashkenazic Jews. Right. And I mean, they have every right to claim European heritage and, you know, claim to be European if I they want so to talk desire. About the gypsies also to mention, because I know the gypsies, you know, it's a misnomer. They're, they thought they came from Egypt, but really they come from India. And uh, you had mentioned that, but, but uh, you know, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I did want to uh, ask you about the gypsies also. Oh, yeah, no worries. And maybe um, even the Jehovah's Witness and, you know, Freemasonry. <laughs> I, I could talk a long time. Um, yeah. But, you know, because I think the first use of the concentration camp was actually for Jehovah's Witness. They and, were among the first, yeah. And, and in fact, that, they were mostly ethnic German Jehovah's and, and, Witnesses. And that, uh, I have some books specifically on that history and that uh, um, the leading Nazis paid a lot of attention to uh, getting the, it was like considered a national security threat or something that they wanted these Jehovah Witnesses to uh, <laughs> renege. Yeah. And yeah. uh, only a handful of them did. They had the forums and almost right. none of them reneged, but but that uh, Hitler, Himmler, different ones, they visited these camps of witnesses and spoke to the witnesses and mm -hmm. wanted to get them to renege. And that's an interesting part. I don't know if uh, you want to talk about that or maybe Freemasonry is uh, also a very interesting topic. That uh, Yeah, we can certainly touch on it. Um, just really quickly in regards to the, the fines that were placed on the Jews after Kristallnacht, that was an ignominious part of Nazi history. Vecker acknowledges that, but she says it's totally exaggerated. And I'm not going to read all the different ordinances. Like she goes through like paragraph by paragraph to explain exactly how much was levied, et cetera, et cetera, charged. But she says the motive behind this was to, again, squeeze the Jews and make their life increasingly unpleasant to give them impetus to emigrate. So that's why it was done. It was not done to totally exploit the Jewish population and turn them into welfare cases, because that would have burdened the German government economically. So that's not why it was done, contrary to what Orthodox history says. But um, I will, when you get that Crystal Knight book, you can read through that in detail. So no worries on that one. Um, as regards Nazi race law, well, the biggest contention that like your neo-Nazi types, white nationalist types, is that the Germans were a pure race and they were essentially an Aryan race. So first of all, there is no Aryan race. It is a linguistic category. Um, no one knows, in fact, exactly where the Aryans hailed from. Supposedly, it was kind of north of India, and then they migrated into India, and they became known as the Aryans, whatever the case is. Well, There's the biblical, a lot of myth involved there. Obviously, the biblical Ashkenazi, Ashkenaz is the grandson of shame. And according right. to the biblical, you know, the 70 nations, and you have, you know, the Europe, the shame largely settles Europe and uh -huh. um, Africa, and, and I mean, shame, Middle East, and Jaffet, Jaffet, Europe. And right. Ashkenaz is Japheth's grandson. And according to the biblical scholars, you know, after the Tower of Babel, the descendants of Ashkenaz settled Germany. And that's why you know, Ashkenaz is not means German. So, you know, say I'm an Ashkenazi Jew means I'm a German Jew. Right. And, so and like, there like, there were you, Nazi you, racial anthropologists that brought that up too. You know, it means saying I'm an Ashkenazi Jew, but you're actually an Ashkenazi. Okay, there you go. Because Ashkenazi is just the Hebrew understanding of the origins of the Germanic people. Right. So that completely contradicts the Khazarian theory then. Because there's, of course, the people that advocate the, the Khazar theory where Ashkenazi Jews are purportedly the descendants or the remnants of the fallen Khazar empire. 
It's interesting, the Talmud, the commentary the, about the, the destruction of European Jewry and, and the commentators that already predicted a thousand years ago that uh -huh. it would be the descendants of Ashkenaz that would destroy European Jewry. So it's it, it, interesting, these, you know. That is pretty interesting. Prophetic <laughs> predictions of the Jews that, uh, you know, going back uh, 800 years that the, some of the commentators had predicted that the European Jewish experience would be um, destroyed by the descendants of you know, the by the tribe of Ashkenaz. So the Germans. Yeah. And interestingly, the Germans are well. In a lot of people's opinion, the Germans are destroying Europe today with the with the Muslim migrant thing. Who knows? Um, I mean, relatively any... of the pure nations. <laughs> if you look at the ethnicities of Europeans and and different people, that's where you said that the Germans are actually more ethnically mixed than a lot oh, yes. of the European nations. Right, and that's what I've tried to explain by pulling from the Giuseppe Sergi research, etc. Now, the one thing I would contest JF on is that he said it's all in the DNA. And I agree, the DNA is extremely important. And then he, of course, confirmed my hypothesis that haplogroup is a very good indication of the relatedness of peoples. But so, the Nazis themselves thought, I mean, although evolution had been part of it, they were still largely spiritual and they actually held that it was a soul difference. You know, just like as where Jews believe Jews have a different type soul. Right. There are people that the Germans actually held there was a difference in the soul of the German people. Well, that's kind of where the whole Nordic thing comes into play, that you can be a Nordic if you just have the right attitude, the right Nordic soul, as it were. So you could have the wrong body, but you could have the Nordic soul. Well, so to say, if someone converts to Judaism and the theology, they gain that soul upon conversion. So you go into like the baptismal water. Mm -hmm. When you come up, you come up with a new soul. And uh, if there was a conversion to Germany, you know, to the ideology, you could a, a non-Aryan obtain an Aryan soul or, or if it's a mix between the blood, uh, how they understood the theology. Right. That probably would have mostly preceded national socialist racial theory and ideology, but I do see some of that in Christopher Hutton's book, his analysis of Nazi race theory. There is some metaphysical backdrop, and it's much along those lines. There were racial theorists who believed that Jews could become essentially, quote unquote, Nordic or Aryan. And so they were willing to extend citizenship and Germanhood to those Jews. Um, but the Germans themselves, I mean, if you look at the Nazi primer, which is an English translation of an actual 1938 student handbook, this is what the Nazis were disseminating to the young people through the school system, Hitler Youth, etc. In educating them on regarding race, it literally says pure races of people scarcely exist today. So this is where they're contradicting Rasenkunde des Deutschen Volkes by Hans F. K. Gunther. That's his book. And they're saying collections of individuals with the same biological inheritance as the term races may be defined have everywhere intermingled. Race mixtures have sprung into being. And they say this is the case with Germany. So we have all different proportions of different races. Now, the funny thing about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists today is they'll say, no, no, Veronica, you're wrong. You're saying that Nordic and, and East Baltic and Phalian, et cetera, are different races. Um, no, they're not. They're all the same race. They're all white race. That's not what the Nazis said. And the only thing that matters is what the Nazis said, not what they think now today. So the Nazis believed that the Germans were essentially composed of six basic races, and they define these as different races, not the same race. Nordic, Phalic, Western, Dinaric, Eastern, and East Baltic. Is if there you, a biblical, I'm saying like if you're a Bible person, to say that these are six different um, descendants of Japhet, or, or, I mean, because I assume the bi the biblical understanding was probably still one of the more popular understandings, even World War II. Okay, who would who would be the the Mongols? Are they Japheth? So, I mean, there's dispute whether Japheth is all European or whether there's different things you know, that whether the Aryans like the. It's interesting because the uh, the ancient commentators 
say that Iran is from the tribe of, uh, you know, Iran is the word right. Aryan. Um, so the biblical commentators say that uh, that's Tirsus, who is the grandson of uh, Japhet. So Ashkenaz and Iran are actually brothers. You know, so okay, there is some so there is some interspersion, and this is you know biblical commentators going back two thousand years that right. are understanding the history of the world as the origin of nations as the seventy, and even to understand uh, you know something that wouldn't make sense according to modern biology that Noah and his wife would have had one son that was you know black and African, one son that had blonde hair and blue eyes, and one son that was Semitic, and they were all the genetic uh, direct. Uh, children of uh, of noah and and you know whatever understanding of the bible you take that but according to the typical biblical understanding that uh, you know parents produced people of different ethnicities and and then after the tower of babel they went separate ways and uh, formed the nations of the world till today and even like the ottoman turks uh, right. had that uh, lineage like they held that they were descended from these tribes and uh, uh, traced uh, you know so that going into world war one you had major players in Europe that their understanding of nations was completely based on, uh, you know, this uh, Noah's 70 grandchildren. Until today, um, it's still a pretty popular theory. Okay, so... I, I, might, if, I might even personally, like, you know, like I, I quote Newton a lot and saying definition of intelligence is to hold multiple conflicting ideas in your head at the same time. But I'm always working with these ideas. Well, maybe the Bible is literally true. Maybe the story of Noah and the flood, and uh, you know that we do have one common origin, and mm -hmm. the nations did arise from the seventy grandchildren of Noah. But I mean, it's it's only semi relevant to what you're saying because the origin of these six different nations, right? That actually has biblical precedence where the um, scholars historically who had understood the origins of European nations, according to that. Or, or, you know, what were the origins of these six different tribes if it was, uh, you know, where did they come from? Right. In that case, if you go with that perspective, yes, these would all be, I guess, related to the tribe of Japheth. That would be correct. But if you look into the racial anthropological research behind these races, East Baltic is not white in the sense that white nationalists understand it. Neither is Eastern, neither is Dinaric. Those races had Mongoloid, Negroid, Mediterranean, so other race influence, non-white in other words. So this is why I'm trying to explain to the white nationalists that the Nazis had already acknowledged that the white race was, it was already mixed with non-whites. There had been non-white infusion. So their irrational fear of non-white infusion, which is always limited even to this day, even owing to the cult of diversity where it's really being pushed and promoted to white people, it's always gonna be limited. There's but, nothing to fear because they're, they've they already had the this in their Reich. past. It is the Third Reich and the First Reich is, is Charlemagne, who interesting, uh -huh. David Duke claims to be a direct descendant of Charlemagne, whatever, uh, if that is anything, but, but uh, that, uh, you, was it an inception spiritual, something to do with the rise of Charlemagne and the unification of Europe under Charlemagne? That could be part of it. I know Hitler references that in his discussions with Otto Wagner, and he has just great admiration and respect for Charlemagne. In, for that very reason. It was so a spiritual was kind of inception, that they had some sort of spiritual soul understanding that this you know mixture of different races under mm -hmm. the unification of Charlemagne acquires some spirit to them that didn't exist and exist afterwards. So it doesn't matter the origin because with right. the rise of the First Reich that they obtained some sort of spiritual direction behind them unifying the tribes. I don't really know much about that kind of metaphysical viewpoint. Again, there were racial anthropologists that talked about that. What and is obviously kind of, they sent expeditions to the Himalayas and in, in the, exactly, yeah, the SS. Yeah, there was. I mean, Himmler was certainly interested in how this all differentiated. He was trying to get to the point of origin for the uh, basically the Indo-Europeans, eventually branching into the Germans, 
in order to understand exactly where Germans came from, that's that plays huge in the SS research for sure. So yeah, I would definitely say Himmler was interested in that and had some kind of spiritual interest in understanding how the different races were unified. Um, was that, it's, the, when Quite I debated JF on multiculturalism, that was my first point where he mentioned, uh, you know, like the Christmas tree is like Christmas tree is a multicultural symbol. White is a multicultural in what I would call like a new world order or universal brotherhood of man is that, you know, so, you know, his That's perspective, true. once you have the French and English together to form one society, mm -hmm. um, is it such a big stretch to have the universal brotherhood of man of all of humanity? And so, yeah, okay, Germans, a multicultural conglomeration of a few tribes right and and you know so why not just have the whole universal brotherhood of man as a conglomeration I, of all tribes who are saying like i want to protect my identity right you know, what really what do you know, these extremely difficult questions of you know identity is actually almost a paradoxical unanswerable question i see your point i think what ultimately ends up happening that causes problems for that though is because you start bringing in men who think so differently from you for example when muslims come into a country like australia they don't want to be the brotherhood of man they want to bring sharia law and they want to put women in the muslim garb and cover them up and impose their religion on the country that they've now supposedly assimilated into. And this is happening increasingly because it's being encouraged by the left and the multicult. Well, say if, if you, you just to pick out what you're saying, you're saying Islam is a universalistic system and the system of Islam is meant to incorporate all of humanity. Um, and you could have nationalism within that as opposed to a nationalist who say we have a specific way for our people and that doesn't correspond right. with other peoples. You can't, you maybe have a global trading order of right. universal brotherhood of manner, but within society, people live according to such different ways that you can't have a universal brotherhood of man within the same nation. It would be difficult because of different economic viewpoints and different religious viewpoints. I think that's or, or ultimately what the causes right most of the trouble. Yeah, so if you're a good Muslim or, or Jew or Christian, you say, no, no I'm saying uh, Jesus Christ or Muhammad or Sharia law uh -huh. is what is capable of unifying the whole world. And people just don't realize it as you know, maybe that you're saying the Aryan ideology was just, we just want to unify these six nations and control right. Europe. And they didn't really want to dominate the world. I would say they the would Germans. Have, they would have recognized yeah. uh, the Hindus. Indians right to be a free and independent Hindu nation in Japan to be a free and independent Japanese nation and they just wanted to unify these six tribes and be safe in Europe to protect their way of life. Well, and yes, I would say that's correct. Well, and, and go and, ahead, John. Well, no, it's actually uh, Brendel Fly here. Um, oh, my, my understanding is that the Nazis actually had sort of a, a bio, a, a mixture of biological, cultural, like a biocultural understanding of what race is. And so, you know, these cultural differences matter and even, you know, sort of slightly different racial groupings. Like we talk about the six tribes of what would make up a German. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there's a cultural unity and, and frankly, you know, when you do these these genetic studies and look back into ancient history of like what makes up an East Baltic person, um, you know, so much time has passed that it kind of becomes irrelevant. I mean, sort of on, on the large scale of history over thousands and thousands of years, like race doesn't matter as much. Um, what matters is mm -hmm. what it's right now. Um, and, and I think that you, know, you were talking about sort of explaining to white nationalists or, you know, the argument of, like, who is white, who's not white. And I, right. I think there are people who are autistic about, like, well, you know, the, the, you know, the meme of the 100% Bavari pure Bavarian phenotype. But I think, you know, it's, it's kind of like, does it pass the smell test or the eye test? Like, you know, the famous saying, I know pornography when I see it. I know a white person when I see it. 
Right. Well, that's really what the Germans were struggling with, is they were struggling to identify Germanness in positive terms as its own racial element in Europe. So they had to try to find pre-genetics distinguishing factors that were more or less racial in their viewpoint from Slavs Germans, uh, Frenchmen Germans, North African Germans. And it was very difficult when they looked at Jewish Mischlinge, for example, because they look exactly like the Germans. And then the Slavs, a lot of Slavs looked Germanic or Nordic. And as Nordicism gained preeminence, Germanness became less important. And it was the Nordic element that everyone was looking for, which uh, Duvid had alluded to before, which was the blonde haired, blue eyed, tall, you know, the more rectangular skull form. So that starts featuring more prominently in the minds of these racial anthropologists and what they're desiring for Germany than actual literal Germans themselves. And that's where the danger lies. Um, Oliver calls it a semiagogue. He calls it the purity spiral. And so he's like, I don't like the way white nationalists of past and present want to get down to this pure thing. Like uh, it, it just becomes too fanatical in its application and its definition. So he's saying they would look at like a Turk, a white Turkic person and say, oh, they're not white because they have a little bit of that other white look or whatever. So that's really what we're getting at is what does constitute whiteness? I, as far as I can tell, JF includes a lot of what white nationalists would call non-white in the white fold from his video that I watched. Well, I mean, no. white is a uniquely American, the concept of white yes. is a uniquely American invention, largely yes. based on the differentiation between not being black, as opposed to the pre-European you know, definition where, where you know, I always joke uh, that, you know, my local synagogues are, are relatively, they're whiter than most neo Nazi <laughs> allies uh, because, you know, Jews have been relatively successful, especially in Orthodox communities in uh, main, in not intermarrying. So right. you, you go to a, a Jewish area, um, they're pretty white. In, 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 in Europe, Jews would have been darker than the average person. But here in America, um, Jews are pretty white in, in, uh, in, so I mean, it's very difficult these definitions and playing around and just fantasizing about an ethno state who's going to be in and out and you know what your research on the impracticalities and how coming down to doing it and there are 150,000 Michelin Jews that were Nazi members you know Brundlefly with his own personal situation you know saying that uh, yeah maybe his son wouldn't have could have uh, excelled among the Nazis despite having some Jewish blood and you know he had light features and uh, Aryan blood or whatever and, and the complicated issues regarding uh, politics today and immigration that you know that that's why this is these topics have became so popular with the rise of Trump well and I think I think um, yeah I mean race fetishism uh, you know standing alone by itself is, is not I, I think as Veronica points out definitely lends itself to the purity spiral and these sort of non-functional, uh, you know, just strictly intellectual approaches to these issues. I mean, I, I think that a lot of people might embrace white nationalism or, you know, care more about the white race as a proxy for uh, sort of the uh, Christian, you know, Euro European Christianity and its values and, and cultural norms. Well, there's a lot of pagan white nationalists out there too. Oh I mean, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, my my biggest <laughs> can, I, can I step in just because yeah. Tom Anderson's a, a regular on my chat and he's asking if you could answer um, the understanding of the the Holocaust intentionalism versus functionalism, and uh, he's saying that why intentionalism has been pushed into the mainstream instead of functionalism. If you had thoughts on that. Intentionalism as in it happened from the get-go, like that was always the goal. Yeah, I mean, presumably not, the understanding that the, the, that the intention of what, you know, they, did, they didn't like the Jews and it was created with the intention of either, God forbid, deporting, expelling, or killing the Jews, as opposed to functional, where they had different, it just happened <clears throat> to come at some point. Functionally, they had to kill the Jews because of the situation 
economically or the war or the inability to deal with the situation in any other way? Well, in my opinion, there's absolutely no evidence to substantiate intentionalism. And as far as the functionalism... But he's asking why intentionalism, I mean, if it's more conspiracy... Oh, why is it being pushed? If you would agree that intentionalism is the mainstream of World War II Holocaust historians and why that is... Because if you look at because if you look at the um, the mechanics of it, uh, it's so easily debunkable. It's absurd. Yeah, but it, that it, it actually the intentionalist thesis is easier to debunk, though, John, because there is no order. <laughs> because there's absolutely no. Uh, I no think order, it's because no it's. it's I personally it's, think but it's according to Raoul Hilberg, you're saying the order existed because what happened to the Jews in the Holocaust was just a scalable uh, repetition of what had happened hundreds of times to you know to uh, the Jews throughout history and if you look at the comparison between the inquisition and the holocaust that uh, that you know, the model was already in place and it was just scaled to a larger site if that makes sense that that, that uh, from an intentionalist perspective right well first things first I need to see an actual order saying the order must have existed because it happened. It does not suffice. So that's the first thing they've got. But to the order, order was ingrained in the mind of all Europeans because it had happened a hundred points throughout history. It had happened tens of times in Germany before. So even if there wasn't a structure among right. that Nazi command to do that, that naturally no, I, they I just I've never heard of structure. anything. Many other uh, structured mass. Well, this is the introduction of Raoul Hilberg's to structure European Jew Jewry and even like Peter Hayes' yeah, I haven't read explaining, that. No, explaining I the Holocaust gives this kind of, you know, saying that the Holocaust just follows this precedence on a larger scale of what had happened to the Jews. Yeah, that to me, it just doesn't make any sense. There's no, no event in history other than just a random chaotic pogrom that's sort of sanctioned by a government that turns a blind eye where something on that scale can happen ad hoc without an order. It, 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 just, it was just in their minds and so they just started doing it. it, it no. Not, I don't believe that. I flat out contest Hilberg on that point. They can't even get the numbers correct. I mean, there are still reputable Holocaust historians who believe in the official narrative and fully believe everything that happened who dispute the numbers. If they can't even get the numbers of dead correct and the locations of where all of them are, then we need to revamp the entire narrative. Well, in you, my mentioned, view. you mentioned uh, you know, just saying your own words, use your own words uh, in support of it, that Hitler was largely his Catholic upbringing that uh, had set the precedence and that basically what Hilberg was saying, that it was this ingrained uh, history that people knew you know, throughout history that the Jews had been expelled and deported in programs. Mm -hmm. And even if there wasn't uh, you know, like meetings and minds and governmental policy, that things naturally fell or just a repetition of history. So there was like a, uh, where did I see this? There was like a mental telepathy by which the uh, Nazis coordinated this without any, you know, uh, actual order, like Veronica said, order documents, uh, a military runs. Um, yeah, I mean, even in the case on, of the Einsatz group, on, then, yeah. they were ordered to execute the groups they did. There were always orders in existence. No one denies that massacres happened, that shootings did happen, but they were always under orders. They didn't just happen randomly and unless it was just heat of the moment military freak out, which that happened too, where an officer would just order a massacre strictly because of fog of war and just being super upset at seeing for example, a comrade with his feet burned off in the yeah, case well, of that, Soviet then, partisans. That did happen. There were random massacres. But then that like, completely uh, doesn't doesn't mesh in any way, shape, or form with a uh, uh, industrialized mass killing right. operation. Right. Exactly. Uh, a, a quick question from the chat, and I know the answer because I've I've been you know following the books you recommended. Um, Jakey Jake, who you know the pseudonym, he's a Jew. Who's, went to Orthodox school and his father actually works in U.S. military intelligence and asking okay. about full-blooded Jews who became Nazis. And I understand that uh, Hitler had the discretionary authority to Aryanize Jews. And there actually were at least a few thousand full-blooded Jews that Hitler personally signed off to Aryanize. 
a little yeah. a little over 2000 of them and it is in fact article 7 of the supplementary decree to the nuremberg laws it says literally the Führer and Chancellor of the Reich is empowered to release anyone from the provisions of these administrative decrees. And that was strictly in regards to the race laws. So Hitler reserved for himself the sole right to exempt whatever, whomever individuals he chose to do that they, for. They started revoking these in like 44 after his assassination attempt and they started revoking these? Not that I know of. I, nope, I think because... I saw that from Bryant, that, that, that uh, from Riggs, he was saying that at some point they started revoking some they of these They didn't revoke them. They just stopped granting them for a while. Yeah, there were instances where fewer were granted, but they were never revoked once they were issued. Okay. I don't do you want to talk about Freemasonry? Do you want to add anything more about this or, or can we talk, you know, can we add Freemasonry and, and your takes on that? Because that's a subject that's very interesting. Well, I, to me. I had started to say something, but I, I guess you, yeah, took, go, go, go ahead. You, you took a question from uh, somebody in the chat uh, as I was beginning to speak. Um, the, um, the whole thing with white or ethno nationalism, um, I mean, my biggest contention with uh, white nationalism is white nationalists themselves. Um, course me and Veronica have spoken about this extensively but um, just so you know and your audience knows where we stand on that um, but um, yeah it's basically the white nationalists themselves and the question of how uh, you actualize an ethno state you know um, well, it's like Brundle who you know is not a white nationalist but he wants he's big on immigration you know, that, right. that, that on stricting immigration and something like those issues and just saying your average american mainstream opinion would be someone with brundle's opinions on immigration is essentially yeah. a white nationalist and even halsey said it last night you know it's like about ben shapiro that uh, ben shapiro doesn't care about the browning of america and so if you care about the browning of america as your reason for your opinions on immigration even though you know, you're within the boat of white nationalism, according to the yeah. Well, that's the problem. Li li liberal controlled media. <laughs> that's the problem yeah. with. Yeah, uh, uh, I've discussed that with my Google, opinion, that's... You know, quite, quite often because my attacks on you know, my disagreement with him on immigration and multiculturalism, and saying he's not, you know, he's philo-Semitic. He's uh, not necessarily any of these camps, but he does have extremely hardline opinions on immigration. Right. Well, I mean, the, the problem with white nationalism or neo-nazis or I mean, whatever you want to call them um is that you've got you know you've got folks like like jf i know he's not a white nationalist but you know he he his views do parallel <laughs> that of much of uh ethno-nationalists um, ideology um but if you i mean I, I believe in freedom of association and if people wish to congregate um specifically with their own uh race and I mean, I don't mean, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, Brundle had to... or whatever, more power to them. And I, I mean, and personally, if I if I found a uh, well, if, if there was a way to have a homogenous society, uh, I would certainly prefer it, you know, to the alternative like what we have currently. Um, but as far as the, you know, the actualization of it goes, I guess I've just I don't know, I've swallowed too many black pills because I don't see any way to get there uh, aside from like some kind of massive destruction, asteroid strike, something well, that's like why that. Veronica's work you know, is so important. Some, because some, you're saying you're talking about something that historically has never existed. So when you talk about like a fantasy, uh, ethnically homogenous nation, you question, well, did, has that ever existed in the exactly. past? How do you, yeah, yeah, if it's never and happened saying, before, it, how are we going to get there know, now? It go, yeah, it's saying it's not, you know, so you question local policy and you know my idea of multicultural conservatism and saying okay you could congregate in like uh zoning and i i discussed this unfortunately brundle had to remove those videos with rodney martin about the balkanization of america or preserving the union and possibly a return to states rights where certain states would be multicultural certain states might even be dominated by certain minorities and certain states would be largely white and there could be a direction towards that within state yeah. rights. However, I mean, all, all the what ifs. As stuff, a U.S. citizen, just... you would be able to travel just like in New York City. You have Chinatown, <laughs> Arab Town, Jews, and these, but you don't need a passport to go from one place to another. 
Right. And, I mean, I find it humorous when, I mean, these types of discussions, I've heard them so many times that it's, it's all folly to me. I mean, I, I shudder when I think of what it would actually be like to live under some kind of like neo-Nazi regime. I mean, if yeah. they got, if they got what they claim to want, um, well, most of them anyway, I'm not, you know, let me rephrase that. If the digital third Reich uh, became <laughs> like an in real life thing, it would be far more oppressive uh, than the main than the mainstream idea of what the real Third Reich really was, and and we all know according to the mainstream Nazi Germany was the worst place ever to live in the world for all time. You know, it's a false even if you're a citizen, man. yeah, don't you I mean, mean, it's purposely yeah. been it, the it, historians and modern political users have personally have purposely uh, corrupted history to absolutely. use that as an argument. Huh. Like, and and I just want to say like. Uh, just to the point about um, sort of JF, a lot of JF's opinions mirroring uh, white nationalism, him not actually being a white nationalist or not being as, um, as Fox Day would call it, an alt retard. Um, right. I think that there are, it, it is important that there are a lot of ideals um, and ideas within the white nationalist community that I think uh, would be healthy to, to have. <laughs> Uh, you know, just certain, I, I mean, the recognition of ethnic conflict. I mean, while a nation may not be uh, ever in history 100% racially pure, ethnically pure, uh, the fact is, is that the ethnicities do compete with each other. That, you know, that. Um, yeah, well, I mean, when, I'm one, multi- when one is not, when one is when, not able, you know, when, when a nation doesn't have, you know, one dominant ethnicity, there's a lot of, you know, conflict right. as. And things well, like see, that. I mean, certain principles are important. I mean, and that's sort of where I when am, is that when we're talking about you know multi ethnicity or, or multiculturalism as it was in World War II Germany, um, you know what we have now. I mean, the the agenda for you know diversity and multiculturalism. We have such vastly different races, you know, coming together within the you know borders of a country. Um, uh, it's it's not this you can't really compare one to right, the other absolutely. i mean these these cultures are so different i mean and i was watching something on uh as stefan molyneux was talking about how they and i read a news couple news articles about how and this was like 10 years ago in in australia um there are aborigine tribes that you know still you know think it's apt punishment for a woman to gang rape her and severely beat her i mean that's a aborigines you know i know muslims have you know, similar things with their Sharia or whatnot, but, um, yeah, that's not going to jump. That's just never going to, I don't see that as working. That's why I, I mean, the, I, the, the way that JF goes about it and some of these quote unquote alt light people, I mean, they've got it right. I believe, I mean, I, I, the, the whole extremist thing, like these neo-Nazis, I mean, God, if they had any power, it would be a nightmare. You couldn't even imagine. And just based on their chat room rhetoric, their yeah. Discord groups that I've seen. I was talking to you about that, uh, David, and just the YouTube comments. I mean, race mixers. Well, I, would I be say put this many times because Jews would all be killed. Every last one of them. Yeah, would, they would string up anyone who even associated with somebody yeah, not free, of the white race. It's madness. When you, Bush, <laughs> when you had Bush, when you had Bush Senior in the creation of the EU, uh-huh. you had most politician, world politicians, European, Western, we're all talking about the, you know, and, and it'll be related to the Freemasonry, but the, you know, the new world order, whatever understanding, you know, that Bush senior had when he mentioned the new world order. And then you, and, you know, Trump, you have this pushback. So I think 15 years ago, you know, before nine 11, um, it had been kind of assumed we're, we're creating this new world order and the brotherhood of man. And it's starting with Europe in the West and it's eventually going to include all of humanity. And the first pushback on that is 9-11. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, say, okay, maybe well, we're not going to have this you know, universal brotherhood together with Islam. And then you have the rise of Trump and Brexit and the fall of the EU to where almost no one's talking about what had been pretty mainstream only a few, only a few years ago. And I, to me, I'm still a multicultural globalist like that, although I would... <laughs> 
I mean, the I problem with the Brotherhood of Man concept is it's not only a white concept. That is Masonic as can be. Yeah, it, well, I mean, it's it, biblical. I'm saying that's the you know the Jews. But, but the that's but that's Jews and white men there. It it really is of Judaic origin then, and what you're proposing is imposing that as a uniting factor when it comes from one culture, one people. Do other people? Well, that's your evangelical that? event. Well, well, obviously they do because that's your large base of Protestant people. Well, Islam doesn't seem to be accepting it too well. well They're they might, having they a serious also, backlash. I mean, because the Silk will. Road, I was saying that, that because Islam believes in the Quran that's based on the Bible and mm -hmm. that would believe that the Jews have a unique role in world history and as an intermediary between nations and that history goes back from the beginning of civilization and yeah. it helped you know Jews in Europe was because we were an international people and the Silk Road and trading that we were able to rise in financial realms within Europe is this intermediary between nations. Mm -hmm. And that if that plays to the future, if you're a Protestant American who's a Zionist, which is still the majority, and most likely President Trump is in that camp and he sees, you no, know, Jews have a unique function and fulfill this role as President Trump has uh, you know, said many times that he prefers. Mm -hmm having Jews do this role because that's what they're best Jews at. will be resented for their current role in this. There's a resurgence of anti-Semitism. <laughs> well, I'm saying they could be resenting, but but he's saying that Our this, respecter. But he's saying that that's historically factual. Yeah. No, there's no doubt about like that. Patrick Little talking about, you know, like quoting Cicero or something like that. And you go all the way back, you know, to Egypt and Babylon and Persia. And Jews are at the center of all empires. Almost all empires, um, <laughs> the Jews were populationally gathered in the place when they were an empire so when islam the golden age of islam most jews were in uh, iraq and babylon you know egypt through syria babylon rome cicero already wrote about the jews controlling the the senate of rome in you know, greece and all these right. things to spain Italy, well i'd say Europe, the real unity of Germany, man then is the U true US. brotherhood of man is capitalism then in trade yeah. Honestly, if you look at the root of this, it's all rooted to money. Yeah. And well, that's, that's really what this system lower, is all about. Well, I'm saying that's wow. the unfortunate lower level of, of it by saying you have a one world order where people could protect their culture, live separately, but mm -hmm. you have some sort of universal, you know, if you're you're a Jew, they said the seven myths was a Noah, just these generic basic moral laws that we could guide each other by. But it seems to me that there's a fundamental for. interest for the Jews to yep. continue capitalism, in particular in globalism, that makes sense because their niche is primarily financial and they're doing very well. But other people don't have that niche and they're being severely negatively affected in well, the said, system. I mean, if you look at it from like a anti-Semitic perspective and you look at it like historically, um, there's no way for society, Jews are going to get a disproportionate benefit if society does well. Uh, but at the same time, if society falls, Jews right. take a disproportionate amount of the punishment. And that's why saying Good the point. Holocaust is in line with well, but what has happened depends. hundreds of times through history. So if America picks up and does the best ever because Jews are in these positions of banking and business ownership, um, we're going to get a disproportionate cut of that wealth. But if America declines, chances are, God, God forbid. Well, it is starting to decline. I mean, look at our deficit. That cannot continue. That's what, <laughs> that's what always happened. There was debt cancellation because Jews were involved in money lending and banking. That when society started to collapse, the first thing they, they did was it. Yeah, cancel the debt. And the Jews disproportionately um, are holders of the debt that would either lead to, God forbid, the expulsion or murder of the Jews, and that that pa pattern, even God forbid, looks like it might be about to repeat itself in America. But, but, David, I will say this: like, right. you know, whether you know society thriving when the Jews thrive, I mean, sort of depends on your perspective. And I think something that you and I have—I said the Jews thriving times, when society thrives, have, not the other well, way around. I think well, I know, but you have something that I think you have refuse to acknowledge or we disagree on this point is that multiculturalism is good for Jews. And so you support it uh, out of essentially self-interest where well, there, we've had this groups. argument before. I recognize my self-interest in saying, yeah, most Jews support multicultural multiculturalism is good for Jews, but also that does not mean that I can't say that multiculturalism is good for everybody and recognize my bias as a Jew. 
Well, and all Jews certainly don't support multiculturalism. That's right. There's I know a, some that a don't. Number of, I mean, Zionists, yeah, but, Zionists are, are, are you know, very, <laughs> they're not multicultural. Yeah, but you we know, all know that in the West and in America, to Nazis. In the West, in America, the Jews are the biggest supporters of multiculturalism. Even you know, even though there's people like Halsey. Oh, they're or, they are or, definitely or, all or different. They are but, all but up saying in there. We're no we're at the, we're largely at the forefront of the movement. Right. And, you know, we're just mentioning you know Greenspan and his. Uh, it's not all his mm -hmm. compatriot Avram Yeshua Heschel, who Here marched with Dr. King, the creation of NAACP, till today. Yeah. That uh, you know that's yeah. pretty factually. Um, well, um, but he's saying that no, I, no, no, no. I'm defending myself. I'm not doing this just because I'm greedy and out for myself. I honestly believe in the universal brotherhood of man, and that's what's best for humanity. And uh, I recognize that, yeah, I have a certain bias in that, but that doesn't uh, just. But do you really think bias. it's? Do you really think it's possible? I mean, do you really think that that? Well, certainly, if, you really think that countries benefit from opening? It comes down to the Bible. I mean, you're saying, do you no, open? Do you no, openly no, no. reject the Bible? Yes. Or, so, I mean, obviously John's Kendall, an atheist. Yeah, so, I mean, essentially, so you, yeah, have well, to look, you have to yeah. look into the fact of you know, we call the mystery of the Jewish people, and to some extent for Christianity yeah. and Islam, one of the logical proofs of well, uh, of of the Bible is the Jewish people. All right, if you set all that aside, um, I mean, do you think countries benefit from opening immigration to to none? And I mean, and I don't want to you know, get down into you know, like Germans and Italians and this and that, you know, I'm talking white, black, you know, Middle Eastern, uh, African, whatever. I asked this because I mean, you know, throughout history, because uh, I'm a, I live in Detroit. I live mostly amongst blacks and I lived in New York city. So to me, that's been my life experience. I've, hey, I've, life. I've been all over. I've lived in the country. I've lived in probably the worst hood you can possibly imagine. And yeah, whatever. I mean, I've got that experience <laughs> under my belt, but I think the most um, relevant indicator, you know, uh, of how multiculturalism is working, because even our technology and knowledge and all these things have progressed. I mean, our basic instincts and behaviors. The uh, technology and multiculturalism, to some extent, have, go, hand, go hand in hand. There might be many. I don't know about that. that. But, but um, the of technology. I don't see technology. Where technology is a white them. technology is a white man thing, and and yeah, well, it really Asian, is. You throw Asians in there too, but and that's I mean, not accurate. I mean, I'm saying I'm saying re relatively historically, maybe going back hundreds of years, but saying Europe has already fallen behind the curve in terms of like the Atlantic Institute ranking of American partners. I mean, in Germany, modern in modern history, Germany is you know, the, the last country, couple hundred years. Right. Germany is the only country in the top ten. I mean, you know, but the human of, behaviors of too. I mean, they've remained constant throughout recorded history. You know, right. uh, I'm saying you're incorrect from the point of the power of, of Japan, China, Korea, India. That you're looking at a history lesson when you talk about. Well, if you want to talk about China and Japan and South Korea, um, I mean, these are all racially homogenous places that are, you know, having great advances in technology, and they are not multicultural. But I think the push of technology forward requires this somewhat universal brotherhood of man and these different people working together. I especially like you look at like cell phone components or something like that. These have global <laughs> supply chains like silicon. You have to, you know, historically maybe colonialization where they figured the Europeans recognized that they needed these resources and that's why they needed colonialization was to control these resources. Right. Well, it's all about money. money. Again, now that, well, I mean, money is a curse. Yeah, we're I mean, talking more about resources and it's like, Oh, the biggest Silicon mines in the world are in China and mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to colonize China. You still need the Silicon and in the, you know, the, almost everything that we use today has a global supply chain. And we don't have to get too far off topic and debate multicultural. Right, but who creates it? The real creators and initiators have always been essentially of Northwestern European extraction. Yeah, but that's if a history If you look at lesson, diesel, that... diesel invented the diesel engine. Uh, automobile, that was another German. The internal combustion engine. I mean, if you look at most of our modern technology, yeah, it's I'm, in I'm particular... I'm an engineer, like I know that history, but you're talking right. So I'm not you're sure talking how multiculturalism history. If you're talking the last 50 years, a uh, European ha Europe has continuously been on the decline, and they haven't, you know, God forbid, became irrelevant in the field. But there's certainly other Eastern nations 
that right. might be more relevant than Europe. But today have you thought that maybe there's a backlash against it? Maybe well, people don't like where it's taking us. So, I mean, Europe stood on the shoulders of giants in terms of Arab and uh, Indian scientists and Greek scientists, and that Europe was just able to build upon what they, the tradition that they were handed. That's not them. multiculturalism. I mean, you know, right. well, that's some intelligent people. That's global you know, economy. That's, really. Yeah, that's well, not that's a form of multiculturalism. I. It is a form of cultural, it's a form of cultural expropriation or technological expropriation, but at the same time, there was give and take between, for example, the Ming Empire and the German cannoneers, because the Ming cannons would explode and kill the cannoneers. So the Ming contracted with, I believe it was either German or Swedish cannon forgers to make their cannons because theirs were so inferior. So, so the technology goes back and forth between Europe and the Asians for sure. But I mean, does your, and does your idea of multiculturalism also include, you know, exploitation between one culture and one race and another? Yeah, because all of these are exploitation. Yeah, not all. My, my vision is more, you know, according to biblical prophecy, in no. saying that all all brothers, all all men will stand shoulder to shoulder in recognition of the same God, and that you'll have this universal brotherhood of man, new world order. That doesn't have an overseer, in a sense. Like I don't. See I can't see Masons not wanting to be overseers. They'll never hand that over. Freemasonry. Well, I think because it's a Nazis belief pattern that, that everybody is a servant and submitted to the same Creator, and uh -huh. you don't need a class of humans to oversee. In but I don't think we all do believe that. I think personally, from what I gather from Freemasonry, they answer to. <laughs> I don't know if it's Baphomet or some other creative force, the architect, as it were. They don't answer to Allah. Or, Lucifer. Or, yeah, but saying free, free, they yeah. don't answer to the same God, though. It's different. Right. Just like modern science, Freemasonry's origin isn't free, – Freemasonry didn't originate in Europe. It might have uh, came right. to its best fruition Egypt, in the last man. few hundred years in, in Europe. And the character of masonry might largely be European today, but it's not a European science. It's a Euro right. universal science. And uh, you know, when these things come to an end, eventually there'll be a period where all righteous people could stand shoulder to shoulder in recognition of the same creator and the universal brotherhood of man that doesn't require people could be directly free because they're free under their creator and not under the rules of the fellow man. And that's your basic biblical prophecy understanding, uh, you know, Masonic understanding of what's going to happen at the end of days and the struggle to get to it. Of course, that. you're going to have major opposition from atheists and people that don't want to go with that idea of answering to a God. I mean, <laughs> I see scientists as assuming the position of God themselves well, with always, artificial I, I mean, wombs and their experiments with human and cow embryos in the United Kingdom, which were actually created and raised to a certain point and then purportedly destroyed how are they answering to god when they're playing god i mean you're well, going to have some serious possible, possible, possible. Veronica, hold on veronica isn't that what we've the conclusion we've pretty much come to that the whole freemasonic idea of god is man himself man himself you know and and uh Maybe well, I haven't got your book yet. The creation of a technical or a, a, or a artificial intelligent AI god, just like the, there's actually a cult now of uh, AI god worshippers who are. I'd have to say uh, that the transhuman agenda and the singularity of Ray Kurzweil dovetails with Freemasonry and its principles. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Well, guess, have you I've looked into that? Do it. All you got to do, do it. All you need to do is watch this movie called Nine. Nine is a good movie that exposes the Freemasonic agenda. <laughs> I yeah, but saying I'm more historian and, 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 and saying like I look at Freemasonry as a true science. So it's just like if you were a Catholic and you're or a Jew and you're talking about all the corruption. But the it's a science of, of what? What it's is it the science of? It's actually I mean because you organ the organization of men and you know the science of monotheism in the science. It's an organizational structure to put mm -hmm. together man spiritual ideas scientific ideas through some sort of degree initiation system of uh, you know morals and dogmas of, uh, of of privileges and responsibilities and obviously man could use it in different ways and there could be corruption so are aboriginals and sub-saharan africans part of this and if so how yeah, according I mean, they to the science of Mason, they couldn't basically, even comprehend it. They couldn't. There are race. I mean, I mean, let, let me give you just a simple okay. understanding to see that that 
nowadays we have all these sciences like anthropology, archaeology, right. psychology, um, and the separation of the sciences that historically masonry was just the system to organize it. So, you know, like the Egyptologist, you're historically the people right. who um, today would be considered anthropologists were Freemasons. That's what they did. They went to, you know, India and in Africa and Egypt, and they systematized all these different belief systems. And they said that these structures by which mankind, so within these structures, aboriginals have some sort of system of justice and organization, and they organize according to Masonic principles. So historically now you'd be like, no, they organize according to anthropological, psychological principles, but these are new sciences, that reality that the Masons have uh, had a pretty strong grasp of what later became anthropology and psychology and sociology. Okay, I get what you're saying. They're saying that they're just trying to describe what universally exists. Already, It's already there and in our instinct. I have so many of these books. I don't know how much you've researched masonry, you know, like uh, church walled signs and symbols and, uh, you know, King Solomon's temple and all these. Uh, right. Egyptologists and people that went to India and, and they said, you know, the, the, the ancient Egyptians had this initiation system mm -hmm. and uh, where, where the priests, the, you know, how did the Egyptians, pharaohs and priestly class do it? And they understood that through a Masonic structure of initiation and saying, OK, were the pharaohs and ancient Egyptians Masons? So he's saying, well, yes, that's what I'm saying, that everybody's basically a Mason. So you say, I understand the world through Masonic principles. So we say, OK, Hitler was a Mason. He may not have been initiated Mason, but the organizational structures, these laws, including conflict, including, you know, are we going to get along? And if I was if I was if I was still a Hitler worshiper, I'd be triggered right now. You're calling <laughs> the Fuhrer a Mason. Well, but, right, I, I know, there's I know, always, I'm there's always the risk of cult I'm mentality different. taking off, though, and I see it within well, Freemasonry. Well, They're very much absolutely. becoming a supremacist cult in their own right. Well, saying like Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, Confucius, and right. saying the, understanding them as Masons. It, you know, so, so when you're a believer in the science of Freemasonry, as opposed to like initiated, like, but according to the science of Masonry, right. it's just saying that these organizational structures were in essence created by God and mankind can only get ahead through falling in line with these organizational structures. So if you want to understand how did right. Jesus, Muhammad, uh, Buddha, Confucius, you know, Hitler, um, anybody uh, till today, they're bound by these generic rules of masonry, whether they're mason or not. I got gotcha. you. That makes sense. But at the same time, the masons the meet in secret. And masonry, is, masonry is a religion. So, but I mean, they meet in you say, secret you say, and lodges. Like Judaism, Judaism is also based on an ethnicity, and masonry is not based on an ethnicity. What are saying? As a believer, yeah, I, I don't, believe the Masonic religion. I don't well, know. modern True. Masonry, modern Masonry does come from the minds of, in particular, white males. Uh, you can't say that it isn't extremely influenced by them and has been for many, many decades since they took it on. And they meet in secret in these lodges. Why does it all have to be yeah, secret? Saying, but that fits in with your biblical understanding of like your nations. The first major power was, you know, Egypt, and then you had. Uh, you, you had Acadia, then Egypt, then uh, Persia, Babylon, Greece, right. Rome, and you're a military historian. I'm sure you know this stuff very well. It is saying that eventually it came to the center of world power was Europe. Exactly. But, uh, but these rules, like what was the organizational structure of Nazi Germany or even you know, Napoleon or England or America? No, today, I get that. that but that, how do you that, explain with this universal principles thing that has nothing to do with Freemasonic subversion and assassination of yeah, leaders and touching off wars and wanting to well, foment cause, cause revolution that through chaos. It's where we talk about spiritual esoteric systems where really it's not man doing it. It's these greater spiritual forces that are driving progress but forward. See, that divorces man of any agency. So uh, that we means have we have absolutely think, zero agency you have the agency the of what deity you so serve. So we should not fight against like evil, evil people who are doing evil things who follow Masonic doctrine in their actions every day with wars and order out of chaos, etc., etc. I... Well, I mean, let's sort of go back to my Newton. The you know, definition of intelligence is to able to hold multiple conflicting ideas in your head at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it's saying, can you get into the head 
of a person who practices the religion of masonry and can you look at masonry in essence to say well maybe masonry is a true religion and actually it does have something to do with the way god runs the world or if you're just oh, I, I don't doubt that for a second but yeah no i would agree but they have they what, do what really are their good. actions you know what well, I'm saying just like there's good and bad Jews. I mean, obviously they're good and bad Masons, and, and, you, and that's why I'm trying to separate the esoteric understanding for how world events unfold, as opposed to looking at specific Masons. And, and you know, because I'm playing kind of a game here, because yeah, to me, basically know. everybody's a Mason. So I'm not like, oh, was you know, we know like Newton and Napoleon, or you know, right. different people. These people, we have records that they were members of lodges and you know, the founding fathers of America and, and uh, the rise of science and enlightenment, these people, a lot of them were actually lodge masons. But then to historically look back and say, well, basically anyone who accomplishes something only was capable of doing it through the power of masonry, whether, so is this they, were, just, is, whether you, they were initiated mason or not. Is this just about, you know, reaching a, a, a comprehension and understanding of it? Um, well, I mean, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just trying the, to express, it means like if you're asking about masonry as a religion. So obviously when we talk about it historically, am I going to argue like, okay, you know, you know Paro, Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, Confucius were masons. I don't have evidence for that. Um, you right, know, they deny that they're a religion, in fact. Most you, of them do. So, I mean, just like a biblical person who's interpreting current events based on their understanding of biblical prophecies and like, well, did the person themselves believe that or say that? But it's like, well, no, but I still understand events through this lens of biblical prophecy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've, I've done a lot of research on it. I was saying the change in masonry from the construction guilds with the enlightenment that that uh, um, that generally people had to work through the bottom ranks. They had to work through construction guilds. Um, military and then and you had this leisure masonry class of intellectuals and that arose in europe and that was capable of now what about their opposition to catholicism because many many masons made it a point that bringing down the catholic order of things in that worldview and that lens was fundamental to freemasonry and they well, wanted because that's the birth it. of masonry in in england with like newton and cromwell and henry v and then there's a lot of evidence i'm saying that the break it i mean masonry was the organizational structure that the protestant uh that unified protestants through northern europe and that helped to uh, overthrow catholic rule to create these different protestant structures that organize today that I mean, protestants were your main force of european masonry of course you could say that with anything though you could say that judaism is really truly the understanding of underlying universal laws i think this there's factual evidence because we know Cromwell and Newton and uh, mm -hmm. you, we have the names of all these people and we know that they were Masons. We have their lodge records, um, you know, right. Benjamin Franklin and, and saying like that, I'm not talking hypothetically, you could trace these historical records and say Masonry was the unifying religion of the Northern European man that drove forward progress. I mean, what's the one, okay. they might've been Christians, but what unified? Right, what, no, what, I, what I would agree with that. These, you know, saying was Leibniz uh, or you know, what unified Newton in the main, you know, science and philosophy that pushed progress forward. Mm -hmm. the, the main unifying factor is masonry. I agree with that. I don't contest that. What I contest is changed. their you good talk intentions. Like Rabbi Adam Weishaupt in the creation of Illuminati and the possibly a change in the, if, if you, you want to take, I mentioned the uh, Nesta Webster. <coughs> and I like Albert Pike because Albert Pike's a Kabbalist of the, the Kabbalists somehow subverting and taking control of uh, the Masonic orders, you know, in, in uh, with the French uh, Revolution. I've heard of that too. I mean, that's pretty yeah. common conspiracy. I mean, if you read Nesta Webster and, and yep. uh, even like Madame Blavatsky and, and different, to me, I have a lot of interest because I'm esoteric in general. I believe in the soul. And like I said, I like to look at these greater forces. So you have free will and agency but to some extent, your agency is what deity you choose to serve. Um, but you have no other choice in that matter in terms of your agency besides your host of different uh, higher forces that you could choose to submit to. Okay. Well, if what that, about atheists? That, if I mean, they to don't some extent, that, that's the higher than... force that they're submitting to. 
what higher mm -hmm. force would they be submitting to? To me, yeah, I, don't, I, don't I think I think progress. any higher force. I mean, <laughs> Veronica is my higher force. <laughs> Submit to her. No, I'm on. I'm but asking saying, honest I'm, I'm saying honestly because that's like female worship. It's like goddess worship. And saying like you're. <laughs> no, if, I wouldn't. If, I wouldn't take it that far. But but saying when you you're looking at progress as your deity because atheists. If you're just a complete, uh, I'm not looking for or, progress. Or I want destruction. I, every day I pray for absolute destruction of everything. I think that's John's the only. a nihilist here. Well, um, I think the there's got to be limits to progress, though, because progress appears to be taking us in the direction of transhumanism. Yeah, where we're going to be part is, robot. Progress is taking us directly into what you might call the apocalypse, where human extinction. Yeah, well, no, humans are not. extinct, or we evolve into, or, or per, we're forcefully evolved into some kind of uh, human AI hybrid where you know so whoever, as a believer, whoever the powers may be at the, at the time can can literally control us via remote control. Yeah, I think AI dovetails with Freemasonic progress. That's Absolutely what I'm seeing. It does. They love that shit. Yeah, I mean, but you have to really understand you you if you're looking at organized masonry mm -hmm. versus just using the Masonic religion to understand the progress of human events. No, I, yeah, I, I think we're that, talking I about organized masonry and I understand that, that maybe you can use uh, You're talking about like knowledge Zionism. of Freemasonry. I just told you that to Zionism understand. is a heresy. You know, right. My perspective, Zionism is a heresy, um, but yet Zionism is the main paradigm of the majority of worldwide Jews today, even though it's a heresy. So I mean the same aspect would apply to Freemasonry where these certain heresies have entered the lodge, and most people well, are actually I, members of the so organization. What, I guess I, I can ask you, you, Duvid, what is what is the answer then? Do you would you call for the eradication of the Jewish state? I mean, are you calling for it to not be there anymore? I'm not calling for answers because I'm submitted to higher forces. So it's saying that. Uh, but if know, it's I mean, a heresy, is it is it inevitable that it is not going to continue to exist per the laws of Freemasonry? Well, if, since it's going against progress, if I, if I it's change, nationalistic. If I, change the word, if I change the word Freemasonry to karma, if you let mm -hmm. me do that and just okay. rephrase your question, um, and, and if you understood you know, what we're calling Freemasonry and could translate that to karma. Right. And you're saying, yeah, can Israel survive according to the laws of karma? And I would say, I don't think so. Like, I don't, according to my understanding of karma and action reaction, you can't get away with that for, for you know, the eventually um karmatically um there's going to be a backlash i, I think most nations in the world if you want to go if you just want to go off of karma i mean all nations are run by crooks criminals and you know but there's certain you know, saying, yeah, a lot most leaders are people, I, if I but that's why from atheism is saying that there Maybe is no iceland <laughs> there's a there's some sort of supernatural force that measures the good and bad of our action and there's these greater calculations that affect you know maybe so kept I, within the spiritual realm and, and that so is certainly a possibility well i saying that's a sim you know like basic theology of any religion you have a system and saying that, that uh, you can't just do whatever you want and get away with it because there is a you know there is a god there is a spiritual world and there is a record of what people do and there is reward for the righteous and punishment I would just, for the wicked. i would just have to change the language a little bit i wouldn't say a god i would say some some things I wouldn't say someone, but you know that's, well, the, that's why that's we the atheist. Both. That's the atheist in me, but I, I definitely am not. Atheist, atheist, atheist and you reject that there's such a thing as rewarding the righteous and punishment of the wicked, and you would say, no, I'm an atheist. I think that God forbid, if you know they kill that person and no one saw and none of them talk, that that's the end of it. There is no karma. There's no further attached karma. There's no evidence. There's no, no, I wouldn't say there's that. There's no witnesses. No, no I'm not you a say, you believe, atheist. You believe that there is no, karma. I don't. Yes, I do. Yes. But how do you, as an atheist, how how do you explain karma? Well, I think. Uh, why I why does it? You just got away. No, I wouldn't self. There's no evidence. As an it's done. I wouldn't be just defined as an atheist. More agnostic. I mean, that's you know, I do I do reject. Uh, <laughs> I do reject the the organized religions and the concepts of. Uh, of deities being, you know, uh, th th these anthrop or humanized, um, um, you know, tyrannical uh, beings who, you know, were supposed to follow scriptures that, um, 
just completely go against my idea of morality. I, you know. So well, I mean, we, if you even look at the Catholic Church today, the priests that have been molesting hundreds of children over the years, they're not following godly Catholic principles. Well, so we could try the to, hypocrisy is incredible. This is an interesting discussion. I order your book and hopefully we'll have time to discuss it more. And I, I wanted to do like a 34 part series on morals and dogma, Albert Pike and cover the whole Scottish Rite system and the different ah, okay. degrees. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of work and I, you know, say, you <laughs> know like I'm it. glad we got a decent audience here today, but you know, usually my audience is extremely small. So it's just like a lot of work, uh, but I, I still hope to do it. But, but in terms of the, you know, your expertise, World War II. So I mean, you have in my mind, the greatest minds of Europe in terms of pushing what made Europe great was largely mm -hmm. this institution of Freemasonry. When you think uh, you know, in terms of science ideas that uh, went through the whole world, we know these people were mostly Freemasons. No, I agree with that. They're, and, that and how do you get to the Nazi, How do you get to the Nazi collapse? I mean, obviously then you have like the Illuminati in your Kabbalist, uh, you know, Jewish conspiracies within Masonry, but mm -hmm. how do you get to the collapse of Masonry to the point where Masons are, from my understanding, there were, you know, five to 25,000 Masons that were murdered by the Nazis. According to Masonic sources, it was 200,000 that were persecuted yeah. or killed. Yeah. But the thing is, is the Nazis recognized the problem of organized Freemasonry and how they were fomenting see, like serious problems in Europe. They were part of very corrupt leadership in, for example, France and Britain. And every time a researcher, one of these German researchers for the NSDAP would look into, for example, Dieter Schwartz would look into um, some kind of scandal or some kind of assassination. They saw all these names of Freemasonry and Freemasons cheering it on. And they also saw collaboration. There was documented collaboration between the early communists and Freemasons. Are you with West, are you agreeing with I mean, so if you somewhat agree with me and Nesta Webster at the same time that there was this venerable, praiseworthy organization of masonry, um, and I don't think Nesta West Webster agrees with that, but at some point, but you do agree that at some point there was this venerable, praiseworthy organization of masonry, and somehow it becomes subverted and corrupted. You said praiseworthy, did you, Veronica? Well... I did watch some stuff on how they played a role in um, building the Gothic cathedrals and really sure, creating sure. much of the culture of Europe. Well, I mean, the specifically science, the Royal Academy of England and the Royal Academy. Yeah, no, there's no doubt they have contributed positive Those, things. They didn't, con I mean, not just contribute, I'm saying that like what we think, what you talked about industrialization mm -hmm. was almost universally um, within the Masonic order in terms of like Voltaire and Hooke and uh, Newton and Leibniz and all those people were basically Masons. All the laws that when you study any science or any form of engineering, you look like who made this law, who created this law, who discovered that? And you say almost all of them were Masons coming from like the 16th to 18th century. Um, and then again, you have that still would have been predominantly the, Northwestern European men who were thinking in those terms and became the intellectual Freemasons. Well, That's the not emerging Academy. out of Egypt. It's actually the Royal Academy of London and the Royal Academy of France. And it's, saying it's emerging out of Egypt because they said it did. Newton himself said it Well, emerges. the foundation certainly is, but the minds that started thinking in Enlightenment levels, like John Locke, etc., those were European minds thinking that. But they, they're standing on the shoulders of giants and they're recognizing the history that comes from... Uh, but that's the entire history of mankind. I mean, we didn't start out with the wheel. It was a slow building process to the wheel. So it's yeah, always like the, a building and expropriation. System. You say, okay, like, you know, we wouldn't have gotten anywhere in science if we hadn't had the Hindu Arabic numerical system. No, I agree with that. I think there's always expropriation in building building. That's why I disagree with the white nationalist idea that white people are the foundation of all modern thought progress technology. That just isn't true. What I'm saying though so is, is there a change modern in masonry? Freemasonry is particularly of Northwestern European thinking. And of course Jewish also because Jews got involved with Freemasonry. They played a role as well. Yeah. So is there a shift when you look at, you know, what, I, what you might agree, like the Royal Society of London and France and the. And, yes, and I would what, say there's a 
shift. Where, where does the shift come? French Revolution. Where does the shift come to masonry being a subversive force that is so bad that the, that uh, even full-blooded Aryan masons have to be killed? Well, I would say it was with the destruction of monarchy. So masons did not support organized Freemasonry did not support monarchy, and they wanted to overthrow monarchy and the Catholic order. Those two go hand in hand with the whole French Revolution and the Enlightenment and Protestantism. Where that was sure. all I mean, we don't have to argue that history. I'm just saying the royals were monarchs. And it's obviously in yeah, England, but Freemasons you have the brought documented. down it. I mean, in England, you have the document. brought that history. down, and they, they ushered in the Constitution, the constitutional republics. According to Pac Patrick Henry, the Constitution was born in the Lodge. That's where all modern nation states get their constitutional ideas from is Freemasonry. So I agree with you. It's had a huge impact. But this is organized Freemasonry, not from Egypt per se. It might be inspired from that in the original Masons, but it took on a whole different persona. So, was there a recapture where the monarchy recaptures Masonry? Or or you think it's like Nesta Webster's, there was a Jewish recapture that the Jews captured and, and subverted uh, Masonry? No, there's a recapture. If you look into the research of Sean Ross, H-R-O-S-S, -S, and his uh, investigations into Switzerland, there's no doubt that the old world order, the aristocrats, the, the pharaonic bloodline as they think they have, has definitely taken on Freemasonry and are proponents of this new world order. They went into hiding, essentially. Yeah, and that's they, very... they work with whatever forces they have to work with to maintain their ultimate power. Some the very monarchy went underground. Stuff there. Yeah, it, <laughs> essentially the monarchy went underground, and their kind of headquarters, according to Ross, other than Jewish advocates of it and, and members of it, as it were, proponents of it, are Swiss, based in Switzerland. So That's you have masses he, of Germanic people that are renouncing their masonry. Was masonry much bigger? And when the Nazis rose to power, that a lot of people renounced their masonry. Or as opposed to the, like the Jehovah's Witness, where very few people renounced it, even on the punishment of death. That uh, I'm you know, sure they were. Oh yeah, many there were. It when the Nazis came into power. Yeah, no, there there were Italian ones that also renounced. Yeah. There were a lot of Masons that went underground. There were ones that feigned renunciation. There were genuine renouncers. Hermann Goering almost became a Freemason. He said it was only because this beautiful woman. Uh, drove by or something, and, and he's like, I, I went on a date with her instead. And I told the Masons, yeah, I, I'm going to go with her. So I'm not kidding you. It's a funny story he told at Nuremberg while he was on trial, at the Nuremberg trial. And uh, so he came within inches of becoming a Mason. And instead, this just haphazard karmic chance that this woman goes by and he's more interested in her and, and trying to court her, that he skips out on the Mason meeting and becomes a member of the NSDAP instead. Is that the, fo I mean, I didn't, when I receive your book on like Masonry unveiled, what, what's the thesis or, or type research in that? That is a direct publication of Dear Aufbau, which is um, one of the organs of the NSDAP. So that is an actual anti-Masonic publication produced by the Third Reich government. So that will give you the official Nazi perspective on Freemasonry, its origins, its goals, etc. Great little book. Oh, it is. Even for simpletons like me, there's lots of pictures and drawings. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody has a phone call. Yeah, that's me. It's actually my mom. So, I mean, we've been going for three hours. And personally, like, if you've seen some of my streams, uh, I could stream for like eight hours and keep on talking. <laughs> And I was in rabbinic school where basically that's what I did all day in Jerusalem and New York, you're like studying Talmud. <laughs> Pardon me. But yeah, if you want to bring it to a close, and I, I really appreciate you coming on, and, and certainly the stuff about the transfer agreement and Crystal Knight, I, I, oh, I appreciate sure. you. Uh, um, and I'm looking forward to your books, and hopefully we'll talk again may, maybe. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm sorry I was uh, so so quiet through the whole thing. I'm just, well, I'm glad people so up. He's guys taking it all in. I mean, we well, still got 17 totally people level. watching. You know, no, that's first, great. For the oh, first 30 minutes, it was only a handful of people. And I think Brundle, um, who had, hadn't been around, I think he shared it on Twitter. And that's probably why we got close to 20 people because Brundle retweeted it.
It's kind of a bad well, time too. Like most that. people work during the weekday, but yes, right. it's been wonderful, Duvid. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I've never had the privilege of speaking directly to a Jewish person about these things. Most of them are either just closed off to it. They don't have the open mind to see the other side of the history or they just have never asked, or maybe they're afraid of me. Well, I, don't know. I, always, I, quote, I give that Newton quote over and over again, because I think it's key, you know, the holding multiple conflicting ideas in well, your that, head at the same that time. Sums, that good. sums me and Veronica up pretty well, because everybody hates us. Jews think we're Nazis, and Nazis think we're Jews. So. <laughs> exactly. We're and your, that's because we're just a mishmash of... Uh, of I didn't even look into your personal details. I just you know saw that you were producing scholarship on these things that I also... <laughs> right. um, I do have 0.1% Ashkenazi DNA, according to my 23andMe. <laughs> 0.1%. I think that's a tenth of a percent. But no, I, it's I, there. I read Yiddish. I don't know if you speak German, but I went to school in, in Yiddish-speaking schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I associate more as, as a Germanic than like an Anglophile because my, you know, that. Uh, right. right. And even the interest that the Jews largely today carry on this Germanic language of Yiddish. Yeah, it's very similar to German. Yeah, I mean, it's based. I mean, it's basically the Germanic uh, structure with added words, but the verbal yeah. and uh, grammatical structure is completely taken from German. Mm -hmm. And they, even exactly. like in Poland, Russia, the unifying factor was this pan-Germanism linguistically. Until today, the be I learned Yiddish, you know, like eighteen, in order to be a good rabbinic student because the best uh, rabbis, the best rabbinic schools, are in Yiddish. That's interesting that Germans and Jews have that more or less shared history. Maybe there's something to it. Maybe there's something to that whole conflict where, you know, it's like sibling rivalry kind of a thing. I don't know. I mean, actually, John, the hold on. John, before you go, eh, eh. Many, uh, many of the racial anthropologists argued that the Jews and Germans shared an, the... Um, eastern race they shared the eastern race core and that way back they were essentially kind of brothers that was a line that was a trajectory and a major thesis in um, early nazi racial anthropology I, yeah Oliver, I, I, I was being was, i was I being a smart ass because i know that that would be triggering neo-nazis to just to oh someone in the chat it. i was this pretending man, oliver d in the chat was asking about questions like uh arianism copying certain aspects of judaism or Jewish the theology. Nuremberg laws certainly did. That's for sure. So yeah, I would say the Nazi laws mirrored Jewish racial. I guess you mm -hmm. call it racial or religious yeah, laws. Yeah, no doubt. So is mm -hmm. there current things that you're researching? Is that how you make your living off of these books? Uh, I'm an automotive technician by profession, so I work on cars and diesel vehicles. But yeah, my uh, military history is. It's slightly supporting me, so it's more of a hobby, though. It's not my main breadwinning source. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. In <laughs> I Detroit, wish it was, so but I'm here in Detroit, so you like I go to the. You see me on Facebook. I'm always going to these automotive technology engineering shows. In fact, we have a huge German constituency um, ah. you know, that, that uh, Society of Automotive Engineers meets. Oh, in I'm sure. You know, next yeah. week. It, I'm a German you, car supremacist. <laughs> he believes that Mercedes and BMW is. That's I drove, I drove a BMW, and, and they're they good cars. So like American cars are heavier. Yes. They're good like, cars, but, but <laughs> like the German cars are very. Um, they don't even compare. German cars are absolutely superior. I'm saying, if you had like a Mustang versus a, a Porsche or something, it could be the the, the Mustang Porsche is even, better balanced oh, all around. Yeah, I'm saying it's, be, it's better balanced, but in terms of the power, the American cars are heavier, but they're very powerful, and the German cars are very you know air, they're designed that the power is nicely incorporated to, right. you know, the, the yeah, okay and, that makes sense the power transitions to the road better and the usability of the vehicle and the drivability they just feel better yeah as, yeah as it's a, a feel thing, thing. Cars, <laughs> like the, car, the american cars they, they might have too much power they're heavy. i would agree with that i would agree with that because i've driven mercedes and bmw disconnected. yeah yeah all right, well, uh, I'm going to get off of here, folks. Okay. Uh, okay. Any specific thing you're researching now? Um, I'm actually doing my research on Nazi-Swiss collaboration collusion before the war, 
In the early years, according to some historians, Hitler delivered a speech in Switzerland to raise money. If that's Allegedly. true, yeah, yeah, it's a purported, but um, it's a very strong circumstantial case. So I'm looking into that. And of course, the role of the Bank of International Settlements, the BIS of Switzerland in literally bankrolling Hitler and making sure that he had the funding all throughout the war and was able to deposit gold in exchange for Swiss francs for acquiring resources. Have you so that's done my much current. research on you know, Raoul Wallenberg? Yes, it, it includes that. And I have a feeling that you know, his there family, was- I think, you know, the Wallenbergs are, they might be bigger than Rothschild Bank. I think, you know, like people make a you know thing about Rothschilds, but I think uh, Wallenberg might control more than Rothschild in terms like- I think No, that, control- but that's the thing in these neo-Nazis and stuff. They don't know anything about the Swiss role in banking. They know zero. So well, just, I want to get Jew, into that. They're saying the Wallenbergs were Nazi collaborators and they were never punished for that. They were basically completely exonerated. Wallenberg yep. broke away from his families and the conspiracists think that actually his family may have been the may have been involved in having him killed. So that he didn't yep. uh, I've heard reveal that, that. But, but I mean, yeah, for the conspiracy in banking, I'm pretty sure that the, the Wallenberg controls more capital than Rothschild. I will look into that. I got Adam Labor's book, The Tower of Babel. So, or no, The Tower of Basil. He calls it the Tower of Basil, like it's the Basel, Switzerland, and it's directly about the BIS and its role in World War II. So he's a really good researcher. Adam I'm, I'm U of M alumni, you know. So what Raoul Wallenberg had went to University of Michigan, you know, to study architecture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that should be interesting. I'm going to write a book on that. So with my co-researcher J. A. Sexton, we're working on that now, and I'm also going to write one about the transfer agreement. And how how often do you uh, how often do you podcast regularly? Are you the type of person that has like these big chats and debates or? You just have your thing with Vincent where you and him talk? Yeah, no, it's mainly just John and I. Uh, we have our own little podcast we do usually once a month because we're both extremely busy. And well, we on average, on people. average, we get one done every two weeks. Yeah, average every two weeks. It's been slowing down a tiny bit lately. And of course, it has to slow down for research. But um, if I'm invited by somebody like JF, I used to do a lot of shows with a lady named Deanna Spingola who was into um, alternative World War II history, I will. I'll always come on as a guest, so. I really appreciate talking with you. I'm looking forward to your books and you know, maybe we'll be in contact. I, I don't, I haven't been streaming that much often. If, if you're streaming on a topic where you want, you know, someone who knows about, I, I don't really have expertise in anything, but I, I've- uh, Oh, we'd, we'd love to have you on. You could message me and I'll join. Oh, yeah. No, you have a very wide knowledge base. You're more knowledgeable than almost every white nationalist or something on World War II I've ever spoken with. So. Yeah. If anything, just to trigger <laughs> the hell out of them. Don't please. shortchange yourself in that regard. You're very That's well read and our... stuff on Crystal Night. <laughs> well, I mean, because I'm a Jew and saying I know my history and I go to synagogue <laughs> with people who live through it. But in terms right. of like the generic European World War II history, uh-huh. You know, like I, I, I maybe have the knowledge of an undergraduate. Uh, I've read some books. I'm constantly reading, teaching company. But yeah, I mean, saying my Jew, my, I know the Judaism certainly the top thing I know about. Right. No, that's great. And, and, and that will and come when we up, open I'm up, sure. I, I told the Holocaust, in to some perspective, is the single most important event in all of Jewish history, going back thousands of years. Yeah. Yep. Regard, regardless of your. Uh, your stance on its uh, legitimacy. It is. It's preeminent. It is. Well, I could yeah. take. I, I could detach myself, and I just want the everything up. I just want the facts right now. So a lot of people, yep. they have their storyline and framing, and then they, you know, they're not really looking for the truth. So I'm more submitted to higher forces, and just like I'm going for the truth, and I'm submitted right. to the higher forces that uh, I'm going to go with the punches wherever the truth takes me. Is Honestly, I'd on? like to see a group of international historians getting together and going back over the entire Holocaust from beginning to end and reassessing the entire Nuremberg testimonial. That's what I would like to see. And then assessing it from there and getting the most accurate numbers they can, the most accurate guilt they can, etc. Because to me, that has not happened. I haven't seen that happen. No one is earnest about it. Everyone has 
a reason to politicize that event. The universal Brotherhood of Man doesn't exist, so everyone. <laughs> By saying you're, you're going to get the Jews and the Poles and the I would love to see together to, to no I'm saying to, I would I would love to see that yeah whether it's going to happen I doubt it you're saying like, I'm I went to good Jewish schools I'm part of the Jewish community but like I'm I'm a half Jew I'm already a Michelin so you're saying like and I'm the only Jew you've spoken to on this on these topics mm -hmm. and I don't know if uh, as I said most most I. I Hear about the well, most the Jews time. won't most Jews won't engage with the historical revisionist uh, other you know other than when they can control what's you know yeah, then you have said. the Zionist narrative that's very popular well, yeah in, they'll, they'll leave you nasty comments under books and sham reviews and whatnot but they won't actually you got to think about what down. language that if you're I mean, if you're thinking for an American English speaking language versus if you were going to write the books in German or something like they're Polish sure. or, right all right, folks, I'm, I'm going to get off here. I need to turn my air conditioner on because it's about 110 degrees. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you remember how much up. I enjoy streaming. So I, I appreciate you on. And, right. and oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you take so much, care. David. Okay, so take care, and I'll, I'll let you go. And thanks, everyone, who joined the chat. If you had okay. questions, I missed it. I apologized. Um, I put Veronica's link to her. You could find her on Twitter and Amazon. She's got a web page that's linked through her Twitter. So I encourage you to... Uh, Take your questions directly to her. And uh, okay, bye bye. Thanks everyone for joining. Take care.